Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you to those who are logging in today to join us for what is our inaugural Indo-Pacific program event. I'm Shehoko Goto, and it's, it is my privilege uh, to say that I am the director of this new uh, Indo-Pacific program. We have a full uh, panel um, of discussions and we will be hearing from many people who are deeply involved and committed to the success of U.S. Indo-Pacific relations. So without further ado, let me introduce our, uh, the Wilson Center's CEO, Ambassador Mark Green. Thanks. Thank you, Shahoko, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, whether you're here in person or virtually. Uh, this is a special occasion, and I like to believe the Wilson Center is a special institution. You know, we're congressionally chartered, we're scholarship driven, and we're fiercely nonpartisan and independent. And I always say that that unique status creates special obligations for us, not to duplicate what others are doing well, but instead to look for those openings, look for those places where we can add value and make a difference. That's why in 1977, the Wilson Center established our Asia program to lead our research and programming on the world's most dynamic region. And it's why we're launching this new chapter today in the Asia program's evolving work. In recognition of the new geopolitical reality that the Indo-Pacific is one interconnected region, one vast interconnected region, I am pleased to announce that the Asia program is reshaping itself into the Indo-Pacific program. Be very clear, this is not simply a name change. The focus of our future programming will address shifts in the regional order, its economies, and technology transformations. And we will promote deep discussions and thorough analysis, scholarly analysis, of the shifting center of gravity and in international affairs towards this, the world's most populous and economically crucial region. <coughs> This new approach also reinforces Wilson's commitment to supporting sustained U.S. engagement in the region, military engagement, diplomatic engagement, and economic engagement all across the region. And it highlights the importance of strengthening cooperation among U.S. allies and partners as we confront shared challenges and, I think, seize exciting new opportunities. Last fall, we named Shahoko Goto as the director of the Asia program. She has hit the ground running, and she is the one who has really brought us to this day and to this moment. I also want to take a moment to recognize the Indo-Pacific Program team. Michael Kugelman, who leads our South Asia Institute, Lucas Myers, Kayla Orda, Joshua Spooner, and Mary Ratliff. Thanks to all of you for the great work that you do. Uh, as I used to say in my political days, thanks for everything you've done, and thank you for everything you're about to do, the hard work that is ahead. And we will also soon be announcing a new director of our Korea Center. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be joined by so many former and current U.S. officials today. You know, we've turned to them so often over the years to strengthen and guide our work, and we'll be turning to them even more in the months and years ahead. Again, thank you for everything that you've done, and thank you for everything that you will do. Just as partnerships and alliances are the key to America's interests in the region, partnerships are key to our work in the region. I really can't think of a better way to launch the Indo-Pacific program than to hear from someone who has not only served in a key post in the region, but has been putting his experience and expertise to work in the U.S. Senate. Senator Bill Haggerty has served as the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, <laughs> and he now represents the great state of Tennessee in the U.S. Senate. He has also got uh, deep business experience, which gives him, I think, a, a special outlook and analytical framework for the work of the Indo-Pacific. He's a friend of mine, and he's a great friend of the Wilson Center. He's the ranking member in the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on State Department, USAID, International Operations, and Bilateral International Development. Last November, Again, because of his particular business expertise, he helped to lead a trilateral uh, executive's economic dialogue among business leaders from the U.S., South Korea, and Japan. He's the right person for this work, and we're delighted again to have him here today. 
Uh, Senator Haggerty, I invite you to join us on the stage in your conversation with Shahoko. Thank you. Uh, Senator Haggerty, it's such a honor to have you here today oh, to, help, to us with you. help us launch this um, uh, program. So if I may get straight to the point, it's been over a decade since President Obama outlined a strategic rebalance to Asia. Um, that has actually gained traction over the subsequent presidencies. Both Presidents Trump and Biden have supported this idea of an Indo-Pacific and a rules-based order in the region. But at the same time, we're seeing greater competition between China and the United States, heightened tensions over Taiwan, a closer economic and technology cooperation between Russia, North Korea, and China. So in light of that, how successful has this rebalance to Asia and this rebalance to the Indo-Pacific been from a U.S. perspective? And what are U.S. interests as a Pacific power? Well, what, what we've seen is, um, I think, as you described, Shoka, and by the way, congratulations on your new Thank position you so here. <laughs> I'm so pleased to see uh, this, this institute focusing as it is uh, on a, a region of the world that has half the world's population, 60% of the world's GDP. This is the right place to focus, and I appreciate the, the, the Wilson Center for doing it, and again, congratulations to you for leading the effort. With respect to the relationship and the alliances in the region, uh, what we saw happen was a quad framework put in place, and that framework has been expanded and expanded administration over administration. Um, I arrived in the region. I'd, I'd, I'd lived in the region before. I first moved to uh, Asia in 1988. Uh, that was an interesting time to be there. I moved to Japan at that point in time. Japan had recently overtaken the Soviet Union to become the second largest economy in the world. At that time, uh, China was a very, very different economy. They were riding bicycles in Beijing, uh, a very, very um, insular place at that point. Uh, some leakage into Hong Kong, if you will, economic activity there. But China was in a very different place. I've seen the region evolve dramatically. Um, North Korea has always been a concern. And um, when I arrived in 2017, North Korea was a dramatic concern. In fact, in President Obama and uh, President Trump's meeting just before President Trump took office, President Obama warned President Trump, this will be the issue that you have to deal with. Um, and certainly we had to deal with it significantly in 2017. And what we had to do was get our uh, military assets in the right place to, to address that. Once that happened, um, the rhetoric calmed down and the room to speak and connect and communicate uh, opened up. So I, I think what, what was very clear to me, what was very clear to Prime Minister Abe and to everyone in the region is that we needed to be speaking from a position of strength. And as I think about the alliance, Prime Minister Abe was invaluable mm. in that. Um, back in 2017, we imposed three consecutively tighter sets of economic sanctions on North Korea. We did that through the UN Security Council. And with Prime Minister Abe's help, we got China and Russia to agree to that. We were aligned at that point, dealing with North Korea. That changed the dynamic. Um, that allowed for, for, for meetings, that allowed for pressure. I'm not saying it was easy at all, nor did we achieve the objectives that we had hoped in the, in the period that I was there. But we moved the ball uh, in a direction toward calm, toward safety. What we also saw was China pull out of the East China Sea. Uh, the Senkaku Islands had been encircled uh, before I arrived as ambassador. That, that changed the South China Sea with our freedom of navigation operations, uh, became much more free during that period of time. And we, we engaged in um, you know, trade negotiations with China, with Japan. I was very pleased to get the <clears throat> U.S.-Japan trade deal done while I was ambassador to get the U.S.-Japan digital free trade mm -hmm. deal done, which I continue to work with this current administration su suggesting that this is a model, the digital free trade agreement that we did with Japan, is a model for the entirety of the region. Uh, I really hoped it would be attached to IPEF. I thought that it would be, and then at the last minute it wasn't. But I'll continue to advocate for that. With respect to what's happening in the region, though, I think we see more and more challenges. I will mention just one, and I'm sure you've got many other questions to, to, to address. But when I was serving as ambassador, I was literally reading in the Nikkei Asia about a, a bankruptcy that was occurring up in the Philippines. It was the Hanjin shipyard in the old Subic Bay. I looked at the bidders. Both names looked to me to be Chinese companies. Um, I called in my team. I asked them if they were tracking that. No, sir. I said, we'll find out. 
who these two companies are. Are they related to the PLA or are they CCP related? They came back in an hour and said, yes, indeed they are. Um, it took a lot of work. I called back to Washington. I spoke with um, uh, the, the Secretary of the Navy at that point. I said, do you want to be the secretary that got Subic back for America or do you want to be the sec secretary that let it go to China? He said, what do I need to do? And I said, you're going to have to create a revenue stream, maintenance revenue, whatever it's going to take, but to create a revenue stream so that we can get the financing done to get in and bid for this asset. It took a lot of work. Our tools, Mark, weren't quite able to do what I'd hoped that they could do. But with a lot of ingenuity, um, that Subic Bay property, with Japanese partners involved, with a lot of people working at it, uh, Subic Bay is now uh, in our corner. In fact, uh, President Marcos is coming to visit at the same time that uh, Prime Minister Kishida comes uh, in next month. There's going to be trilateral conversations then. I am so pleased to see that relationship moving in the right direction, and I, I'm so pleased to see Japan playing a critical and vital role in that. So if I can follow up on the upcoming uh, Prime Minister Kishida visit, as well as uh, the Filipino president as well, we are seeing the enhancement of U.S. partnerships and alliance in the region. What do you think will be one of the um, sources of tension when it comes to U.S.-Japan relations? Traditionally, it had been trade. Now it's less about trade. It really, um, it's not about trade volume concerns. It is much more about economic security. Is there, are the United States and Japan um, working closely together? Do they see eye to eye in defining economic security and in defining what the threat may be in that realm? As, um, as Ambassador Green mentioned, um, I was involved in bringing together business leaders from South Korea, Japan, and America uh, in November of this year. We did this on the margins of the APEC conference. Uh, we had 40 CEOs uh, in involved in this, and our discussions there were largely focused on the connections between our economic security and our national security. Broadly understood that uh, it's absolutely critical to find ways to work together to de-risk our supply chains, if you will. Uh, I think many of us see or perceive a risk associated with the concentration of our choke points, if you will, uh, that run through China. Uh, that's a real concern. And with the Chips and Science Act that has been passed, with other opportunities uh, for foreign direct investment, uh, we're looking for ways to partner the three nations. I'm, I'm very encouraged about that. I will share with you something, though, that would be absolutely vital that we undertook uh, in the previous administration, and, and Prime Minister Abe was a great partner in this. But I worked very hard uh, with the government of Japan to persuade them, and they, and they facilitated this, to put billions of dollars of investment in LNG terminaling facilities, both here in America and in Japan. My point was, the United States can be your very best energy partner. Our LNG is cleaner. Right now, you, you think about the role that Russia is playing. Uh, I think the Japanese realized it's better to be closer, more, more closely aligned with us on energy than Russia and the Qataris. Uh, this was an area of real promise, and we began that flow. We began that process. The second part of the plan, which, which would have unfolded um, in, in a second administration, was to put in place big transshipment facilities in Japan and use American LNG, uh, transship that LNG into Southeast Asia. And if you think about the geopolitical, the geostrategic value of American energy as a counterweight to China's Belt and Road, it would be tremendous. That's the type of long-term strategic approach that we need. That brings us closer to our allies in the region. And I hope to continue to find opportunities like that uh, when, the, when the door opens. Politically, that door is shut right now. Mm. But um, I, I think that that will not be the case in the long term. Mm. If I can also ask about um, the security angle um, and the role that the United States in preserving the regional stability from a military perspective, we see that the United States is engaged um, on multiple fronts, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, ongoing conflict in the Middle East. There is, for now, um, stability in the Indo-Pacific. But what can the United States do to deter, to prevent conflict in the, this region? Strength. The world needs a strong America right now. Um, we've talked a lot about making Taiwan stronger. Some people use the term, term porcupine. 
We have a massive backlog of foreign military sales to Taiwan right now. We're not delivering that. We need to be delivering on that foreign military sales backlog right now. We need to be working closely you know, with joint exercises and things of that nature to, again, achieve what's been articulated. And I think the press releases look good, but we've got to follow through and deliver on that. Uh, that is one thing. I think that there's a tremendous opening for more joint exercises, and you've seen Japan agree to double its, uh, double its defense investment. They're going to go from 1% of GDP to 2% over five years. South Korea is eager to work together. We've, we've got great potential in military-to-military -military, um, cooperation in the region. Uh, if you think about the AUKUS framework that's been put in place, I've been very supportive of that. I think we've got some challenges in terms of our own military-industrial base in order to deliver on that, but we can work together with the Australians there very inclined to do that with us uh, to find more ways, more, more military partnerships uh, in the region. So I think it's, it's going to be a combination of stronger economic and technological cooperation, going back to the economic forum discussions that we had. Uh, it's going to be looking for opp opportunities to create a stronger military presence, and in and, and that I mean an interoperable military presence as well. It's not just a procurement exercise I'm talking about, but interoperability, meaning we need to do joint exercises. I've, I've had the good fortune of visiting the Yamasakura exercises year over year. That's the largest uh, military on the ground exercises we do with the Japan Self-Defense Force. You can see the improvement. It's tangible when, when our teams work together. So there's a lot of room to, to become more effective, more efficient, more lethal. Mm -hmm. And as we do, deterrence uh, obviously increases. Thank you. Senator, um, if I may, I know your time is limited, but if, if you're willing, we'd like to take a couple of questions. Okay. from the audience as well. Um, if you have a question, um, if you'd like to raise your hand. If not, I can continue to, to ask. Yes, Kent. Um, Kent Hughes, a public policy fellow here. And I'm very interested in following up on Japan on our involvement there with, uh, and Taiwan, of course, particularly on semiconductors and how really dependent the whole world is. China and us are dependent on that one company. What's the prospects of building a similar kind of company here, starting with the CHIPS Act and moving forward? I, I think you, you, you mentioned one of the key components of this. Um, one thing that you should know is that alongside the CHIPS and Science Act, I did the permitting reform so we actually could get a semiconductor fabrication facility built here in America in a timely fashion. Before I instituted the reform, and we got this done on a bipartisan basis through both houses and President Biden signed it, it takes a, what is normally a five-year process down to 18 months. Why is it so, why is it so uh, unwieldy? Because these are multi-billion dollar fabrication facilities that we're talking about. They use lots of energy, lots of chemicals, lots of water. And the way the bureaucracy tends to process this in series mm -hmm leads to a very long time frame. And if you think about the pace of technology development in semiconductors, five years is too long. What you're blueprinting and trying to get permitted is obsolete. We've compressed that to 18 months now. And that's the type of approach that also needs to be taking place. It's not just subsidies. I'd prefer not to have any subsidies. What I want to do is make our nation as competitive as possible to create the environment so that it will come here. We've got the biggest market. We just need to create the environment so that these fabrication facilities will be produced here. I've had multiple conversations with companies in Japan that make the machinery that are critical to semiconductor fabrication. Same in South Korea. I think there are great opportunities, and again, I'll come back to the United States as being the largest market for all of this. It makes sense to do the R&D and the production here, and we're just trying to put in place the incentives, or, or I should say, remove the disincentives so that it can happen. If I may follow up on that, um, there is a lot of um, appetite on the part of Asian companies to invest in the United States, especially in the advanced technology sphere. S some states, some U.S. states are more attractive than others for Japanese companies, for Korean companies, and the like. How does an American state become attractive to foreign investors, and how can we use this to like build competitiveness more broadly in the United States? That, I've got to say, that's the nicest softball I've ever been thrown. <laughs> <laughs> some of you may know this, but some of you probably don't. I was the Commerce Secretary of my home state of Tennessee. And we transformed the state. 
Uh, when 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 um, our friend Bill Haslam became governor, he asked me to come in and and serve as a different title, but basically the Secretary of Trade and Commerce. And in January of 2011, our state had a higher unemployment rate than the rest of the nation and lower GDP and lower wage growth. We were also looking at a $1.6 billion budget shortfall on a roughly $31 billion budget, so a material budget shortfall too. Um, Bill Haslam was a businessman. My background in business, um, you know, I basically went through and in my background, I started at Boston Consulting Group. We BCG'd my department and restructured it completely. Uh, we eliminated over 40% of the headcount, but I raised the average salary between fourteen dollars and $15,000 per head, which allowed me to recruit a very different profile candidate. One of them is sitting here in the room, Andrew Hogan. And we, uh, we, we just had a, you know, a complete restructuring and allowed me to really focus on uh, foreign direct investment as well as growing domestic companies. And I started traveling all over the world. I, I would suspect, though I don't know this, that I was probably the only Commerce Secretary in America who could deliver a speech in Japanese. And I spent a great deal of time in Japan encouraging Japanese companies to come to America. We are located in Tennessee in a very centralized place. We have great logistics in Tennessee. And as you know, Japanese companies are expert at just in time. So logistics matter. Uh, emphasizing those logistics, emphasizing a favorable business climate, which we have a very favorable business climate, and I didn't do that. Our legislature did that over years. But bringing all those pieces together and really marketing the state um, allowed us, by the end of my four-year term, uh, we had become the number one state in the nation for creating jobs through foreign direct investment. And we had become the only state ever to be named the state of the year for economic development two years in a row. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, but it takes a, a fresh, it takes a business-like approach. You also have to figure out where your advantages are. We were uh, located at a great place, as I mentioned, a right-to-work state with a favorable business climate and tax environment. And putting all those pieces together and hitting the road, um, we were able to generate a tremendous amount of investment. And in doing so, we created a lot of domestic investment as well because they wanted to be part of this ecosystem. Thank you. Yes. So just to pick back on that question, um, what about training? Like, as you know, chips are not easy to do. Like, for example, a speaker that we use right now takes over 120 uh, assemblies just to make one. It's, uh, I mean, it's good to have a company, but what about the training of people? And not only that, you know, as you know, Korea is, uh, you know, Samsung is going at five nanometers. DSMC is going at seven. While we are, I think, 40s or 50 nanometer, we are way behind in terms of technology as well. So not just training, what about the other aspects? I mean, it's good to have a company, but how are we gonna get it done? I mean, you, know. yeah. uh, you raise very practical and pragmatic questions. On the training piece, I'll go back to my home state again because it's gotta happen at a local level. Yeah. Um, our governor, our current governor, uh, Bill Lee, is very focused on the training aspects of our workforce. That's gonna become the competitive advantage of every state, is the skill level of your workforce. And we've got a lot of ground to cover in terms of being able to support the manufacturing base that we want to see develop here in America for semiconductor fabrication. When you get to the R&D aspects that you're talking about, again, we have great researchers in R&D happening here. Chip design is happening here in America. Uh, we gotta bring all of this together. There's global talent that we're gonna have to bring together again and do our best to attract it right here to America. Because of the national security and strategic aspects of this, it's going to take a great deal of focus and investment as well. It's not just the plants. It's the manpower and the R&D. You raise a great point. Great. Thank you. One last question. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Hello there. Thank you for your presentation. My question is, when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing, there are a lot of raw materials that are critical minerals that go into creating these semiconductors. What steps do you think we can take to secure the supply chains for these critical minerals so we're not heavily dependent, for example, on one or two countries in terms of de-risking? Yeah, that is a very relevant and important question as well. And there's work going on in, the, in both the House and the Senate right now from a legislative perspective to try to facilitate uh, the securing these sorts of supply chains. We're gonna have to work with our allies to do it. And there's, there is no shortage of conversations taking place again between the United States, Japan, and South Korea right now on just this point. And it's not just sourcing the raw materials, it's also processing capability. We're gonna have to have that in a means that, you know, if, if it's not gonna happen here in America, and again, back to the permitting problem, 
Um, for example, we mine lithium in my home state. We can't process it. So we have to, we have to get both aspects of that correct, and it's going to take a tremendous amount of focus. I mentioned my permitting reform on semiconductor fabrication facilities. It's going to take reform of, of a number of processes to get it to work. But from a national security and a strategic standpoint, the, the point you raise is critically important as well. Thank you. And thank you, Senator Haggerty. Um, many questions we would like to ask you, but I know time is precious, so we're very grateful for your time today. Thank you again, and we hope we can Certainly. invite you back again Well, soon. it's a great kickoff, and I know that many wonderful things will come under your leadership and leadership of Ambassador Green. Uh, congratulations to you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to now invite um, Michael Kugelman, who is the Deputy Director of the Indo-Pacific Program, as well as the Director of the South Asia Institute, to come up with the speakers, um, ambassadors, um, Ambassador Kenny, Ambassador Blake, and Ambassador Lippert. Thanks. Wanted to thank uh, Shihoko and Senator uh, Haggerty for a terrific uh, conversation. Um, Hello again, everyone. Uh, it's really, uh, first of all, thank you all for joining us in person and online um, on this very exciting day as we launch the Indo-Pacific uh, program. So we're now moving into our first panel discussion this morning, and I'm really uh, delighted to have with us on the stage three distinguished former ambassadors here to share with us their views on the Indo-Pacific, a region where they have all served previously. I'll be brief in introducing them. We have Ambassador uh, Robert Blake, who currently leads the Southeast Asia and Climate Practices at McLarty Associates. He served for 31 years at the State Department in a range of positions, including Ambassador to Indonesia and to Sri Lanka and the Maldives. He was also a DCM in New Delhi and has served in roles in the Middle East and Africa. Additionally, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia. We also have with us Ambassador Christy Kenny. She has served as ambassador to Thailand and the Philippines, the first woman to serve uh, in those roles. She's also served as counselor at the State Department and as a deputy assistant secretary of state focused on U.S. public diplomacy and strategic communications in the Indo-Pacific. And last but not least, we have Ambassador Mark Lippert. He's served as the U.S. ambassador to South Korea. He's also served at the Pentagon. Um, and as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, he's also worked on the NSC, and he served in the, U in the uniformed uh, military. So it's really a very distinguished group. Thank you all for, for joining us, and uh, let's, let's get right into our conversation. Um, first question is that uh, you all served in Indo-Pacific capitals during the George W. Bush and Barack Obama era, as a time when discussions about pivots and uh, rebalances to Asia were starting to take shape. But we were a long way from, uh, from where we are today with an Indo-Pacific strategy that drives U.S.-Asia policy and, and to an extent U.S. foreign policy uh, more broadly. So based on your, your conversations, your engagements, your experiences in your respective posts back then, and based on where we are today, are you surprised at how far we have come? Or is it more or less um, what you would have expected? And why do you feel that way? So, Ambassador Kenny, let's start with you. Thanks, Michael, and, and congratulations to Shoko and, and the Wilson Center for this launch. Thrilled to be here and to be flanked by two of my very favorite and most distinguished former colleagues and good friends. So great to see you guys. I actually think the rebalance has been a great success. And I'm not surprised because I think the importance of Asia, both strategically, economically, and culturally, is um, obvious to all of us who live in the United States. The influence of, say nothing more, of Japanese or Thai food in this country. The influence of the cultural, Mark can talk more authoritatively than I about K-pop. But the strategic concerns, the you know, world's enormous population in India, in China, in ASEAN, you know, this is a region that I think inevitably was going to deserve and need more American attention, and it has. There are a few things that cause it to be, have caused it to be a little less effective than we might have liked. One, something over which, well, both we, over which there is no control, and that was the pandemic, which I think set back the rebalance in terms of the very strong and important engagement among peoples, leaders, businesses, universities. All that was really put on hold or moved to video, which isn't quite the same as that ability to sit in a room and talk, whether you are, again, a business, a university president. And I think we're now getting back to exactly where we should be with lots of visits 
at every level. The other factor from the United States perspective are other global issues and that, that consume American governments, American leaders across industry and cultural. I still think despite that, and, and I think you know one only needs to look at the news today to know that there are some stunning and serious global challenges, the Asia Pacific is still getting a lot of attention and deservedly so. It is, I think, the most critical region of the world across so many sectors of America. So I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm delighted. And I think our Asian friends are equally pleased. Thank you. Ambassador Blake, did you want to? Uh... Well, again, l let me add my own warm words of congratulations to, uh, to the Wilson Center for starting this program. And it's great to be here with my pals <laughs> who can uh, answer any really hard questions. <laughs> I thought that was what way. you would do. <laughs> Um, I, I think that the Biden administration deserves great credit for their efforts to uh, continue to expand our relations with, with the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think particularly that there's been very good progress on expanding some of these very, very important bilateral relationships. We've established uh, strategic comprehensive partnerships now with Vietnam and with Indonesia, of course, expanded with, with the Philippines. Uh, Kurt Campbell, when he was at the NSC, uh, really did a great job of doing much more with the Pacific Island states, which I think is very, mm -hmm. very important and a growing theater for comp of competition with China. Um, it, you know, I think the area where still, if, if you were to ask pretty much anybody in the region um, where they'd like to see more from the United States, it's on the economic side. And I can just tell you, when I was ambassador in Indonesia, um, President Jokowi came for a, a, a big, important official visit with Obama in 2015, and he surprised everybody by saying that he wanted to have Indonesia eventually accede to TPP. And that was because he wanted to have access, greater access to U.S. markets. And once President Trump pulled us out of TPP, um, Indonesia likewise withdrew its candidacy because it just, without access to the U.S. market, it wasn't worth the considerable trouble that they were going to have to take to, to comply with all the various TPP requirements. So, um, and then we haven't really made any progress since then. So, uh, and all of the countries of the region really miss that. They all, China is the largest market for every single one of the countries in, in Asia almost, uh, and also an increasingly important investor as well. So I think we need to up our game a little bit more on the trade side and on the investment uh, excuse me, on the investment side. We've started things like the the partnership for, for uh, global infrastructure and investment, which I think is good. It's a, uh, a G7 initiative, but it's really only hundreds of billions of dollars. And as you know, the Chinese are pouring in uh, much more than that through their through, through their Belt and Road initiative. So, so I, I think it's largely the, the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit, but there is um, this one area of weakness. Thanks. And I hope we can come back to the economic bit, which is important. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Lippert, did you want to weigh in? Uh, well, thanks again for, um, I don't know if I have to turn this on or not. Uh, I'm, I'm a rookie here um, <laughs> compared to these two uh, veterans. <laughs> um, I guess what I would say quickly is I, 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 I'm, a, I'm in a little different category in that in during the Bush administration, I was on Capitol Hill as a member of the Appropriations Committee and as a uniformed military officer in Anbar province in Iraq. And I think that um, shapes my first point, which is, I think if you think about where we were then to where we are today in terms of the rebalance, I, I think you have to say it's been a, a strong success in terms of realigning where uh, where our interests lie, number one, and, and will increasingly lie in the 21st century. I mean, we were at one point, I believe, spending $4 billion a month on the U.S. Army alone in Iraq at one point, right? And you think about all the throw weight on Capitol Hill, the time and tension and energy in the White House on this issue, the most scarce commodities in Washington, we're focused there and look where we are today. So I think that's point one. The second point I would just echo that I think the Biden administration, along with I think uh, the Obama and different times during the Trump administration has generally uh, moved in that direction pretty effectively. I think uh, that's the second point. And then the third point, what I would say, there have been imperfections, right? There's no doubt about it. There have been some suboptimal 
elements here that we can all, I think, uh, count on or uh, account for and try to improve upon. And let me just list a couple to add to the to the list uh, and in some ways restate it. Um, I think, you know, sequestration during the Obama administration was devastating. Um, and it halted a lot of work in terms of budget reorientation uh, towards the Asia Pacific. That was one because of the draconian cuts that were effectuated. Uh, the second piece is during the Trump administration, I think you have to ar you could argue as a starting point predictability and second treatment of uh, allies especially, but also friends and partners uh, came into uh, sharp focus and became an issue. And I think the third uh, point uh, that uh, Ambassador Blake made uh, was is the the Biden administration trade agenda, right? And I think everybody hears that uh, who travels to the region mm -hmm. over and over again. So I think you know there's, I think the strategic arc is in the right direction. I think it's strong, but lots of work to do going forward. Let me stop there. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, so now I wanted to <coughs> come to where we are today in the present. And clearly one of the big storylines uh, in the Indo-Pacific and the world on the whole is, is elections. 2024 has been called the year of elections, and uh, that's certainly the case in the region that we're discussing. Most of the countries in which you have uh, served recently had or will soon have elections. Uh, and beyond that, a number of other key U.S. partners, Taiwan, India, recently had or, or will soon have elections. Some of these elections have brought or are expected to bring continuity, and others change. Um, so what do you think all these elections mean, if anything, for U.S. interests and U.S. policy in the region? Ambassador Blake, we could start with you. Well, let me focus on, on Indonesia, which, as all of you know, had a very important election on February 14th. Um, and uh, the current defense minister, Prabowo Subianto, scored an unexpectedly wide margin of victory um, in those elections, and so scored a first-round victory. Um, he's, uh, the, the election commission is expected to announce formally the results today, actually, later today. Um, and those are widely expected to reaffirm what the exit polls showed. Um, there will still be some, some uh, challenges, uh, some alleged irregularities. We'll have to see what those are. We haven't seen the specifics of it yet. Um, but I think on the whole, Prabowo is expected to win, uh, and I do expect continuity. He, when he was campaigning, he aligned himself very closely with the former president, President Jokowi, and I think that was one of the reasons for his, for his first round success, because Jokowi enjoys an 80 percent popularity right now in Indonesia. And indeed, as, as defense minister, he did a lot to expand relations between defense relations between the United States and Indonesia. He established a two plus two uh, dialogue with defense and uh, uh, state officials. He uh, greatly expanded our, our, our exercise program. And uh, he did a lot of very important acquisitions of F-15s and, and, and uh, Black Hawk helicopters, for example. So, and he, you know, he's, he's had his challenges. He was, he was on a visa blacklist for many years because of alleged human rights problems in the late 1990s. So while I was ambassador, for example, I wasn't allowed to see him. Um, but I got to know him after, after I left office. He qu has quite a sophisticated worldview. He's traveled all over the world. He's lived overseas. So I think he's going to be much more active on the foreign policy scene, and that's a good thing. We'd like to see the Indonesians more involved in trying to solve some of these thorny regional issues like Myanmar, uh, like the South China mm -hmm. Sea, and putting a little bit more pressure on the Chinese on the South China Sea. Um, so on the whole, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about uh, the trajectory of U.S.-Indonesian relations under Prabowo. Everybody is a little bit worried about governance. Um, I must say I'm not quite as worried as everybody else because he has, um, he has reaffirmed uh, Indonesia's intention to try to accede to the OECD uh, because they want to be a high-income country by 2045. Um, so they've started that accession process, and a very, very important part of that accession process, of course, is on the governance side. So I think he's going to have to maintain Indonesia's standards. And so we'll just have to watch this, and we'll have to continue to, to push them quietly to, uh, to maintain reasonably high standards of governance. Hmm. Thanks. Um, Ambassador Lippert, uh, South Korea is a lot going on electorally. What would you like to say on that? Sure. Um, 
And I also should give a disclaimer at the top. Uh, I'm speaking for myself, not for Samsung, where I work. <laughs> I, um, so I just want to be very, very careful and be clear that I am uh, speaking in a personal capacity here today. Um, with that said, uh, what I, let me just make two points to, to get into it. Uh, first, I think one broader point is that you have to say that uh, with, with the rightfully rightful amount of concern about democracy around the world, at least in Asia, there are some bright spots, right? I mean, millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people will go to the polls this year, right? And that's a really good thing. Uh, and I think that's, that's point one. So I think taking a broader view, that's an important fact. The second is, um, I do expect, broadly speaking, a large amount of continuity. You could throw India into the mix as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think I'm going to get to the Korea question, but I expect continuity going forward there. Uh, I think the third thing that I would say just on the Korean elections is, uh, first, let me, let me just say, a couple of years ago, we had a presidential election in Korea. It was incredibly close, but in a, in a really resounding tribute to a democracy that is young, 1988, um, it was incredibly close. Uh, all the votes were counted within hours. The winner was declared, and the losing candidate had conceded um, in hours. And that is really impressive uh, for such a young democracy, and I think that sometimes gets lost. Uh, um, what's happening now is the midterm elections, if you will, the National Assembly elections, which are off cycle to the presidential election. The, it's a unicameral system, Nebraska, um, and the presidency in Korea is very, very powerful. Uh, so the, the unicameral elections are a pretty interesting uh, thing in their own right. They tend to break late. Uh, and if you talk to Scott Snyder at, at Council on Foreign Relations, who's probably one of the best experts on domestic Korean politics here in town, he thinks this election is more about personalities uh, than about policy. And so look for the, the, the back and forth to be about a, attack ad kind of equivalents. And again, breaking late. Final point, just to get off the stage, uh, I guess two points. The name of the game in Korean politics generally is if you're in the opposition and you're working on the, the midterm election cycle, it's to try to lame duck the president. The president gets one five-year fixed term. You want to build up the big biggest majority as possible, send a clear message, and try to lame duck the president, as it were. I do think, to get off the stage here, to expect continuity, uh, is, is not an unreasonable thing for a couple of, po couple of reasons. One is that the president in South Korea enjoys a lot of flexibility on foreign policy. Uh, not, and the other point is that the United States is really popular in Korea. Polls between 70 and 90 percent. So the alliance is not an issue in this election. Uh, the U.S. is seen very favorably, especially among younger generation uh, Koreans, which are a critical swing vote. So expect continuity. Uh, going forward, you know, with maybe some some slight differences, but overall the direction I think is going to continue uh, hit the way it has been for the last couple of years. Mm. Thank you, Ambassador Kenny. Did you want to add? Anything? Well, let me just add the the one election we haven't talked about, and and that is the election in the United States of America, where in addition to the many millions of voters in Asia who have gone to the polls or will in the course of 2024, we will have an election too. I have no idea who will win that election. But I think what we do know is that in many countries, and our own is an absolutely no exception, there's an internal focus. People are very focused the closer you get to an election on internal issues. And candidates tend to make pronouncements or, or offer ideas that are directly related to how they think voters will respond, not necessarily related to how policy will ultimately be carried out. And again, in the United States of America, we have a, an energetic and powerful Congress. We have a powerful uh, judicial branch. And so even if all the campaign promises are indeed brought up by whoever wins and their team, they may not come to pass. So what I would say is I expect the trajectory of the U.S. engagement with Asia to continue to be strong and to be vibrant. But I think we shouldn't kid ourselves that there could be a space in time where the focus in the United States of America is domestic on our elections, on electioneering, 
And then in the subsequent several months of transition, again, in the United States, the fact that all our cabinet members must be confirmed by the Senate, it means a president doesn't take office, even if the current president is reelected, necessarily with a full team in place. And that causes a bit of a lag in how policy is carried out and what policies there are. So we should know that there is likely to be a little bit of a lag in our own country, even as there are in other countries, as Ambassador Blake points out, that the newly elected leaders in Indonesia are about to be are, are known commodities, and we anticipate a strong relationship. We don't really exactly know how they're going to put together their cabinet and how things are going to work. So I'm going to just throw a light note of caution that elections, which we all strongly believe in, are important, but they do bring change, mm -hmm. if nothing more than in personalities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's an important point. So I wanted to shift to geopolitics, and then I wanted to come back to economics. Um, so um, first question here, many, many nations in the, in the region, in the Indo-Pacific, are, are formally non-aligned. They, they wish to, uh, to balance their relations with the U.S. and China and other uh, major powers. But we, of course, live in this era of intense great power competition. And the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, is, is, among other things, a response to, to growing U.S.-China competition. So how can the U.S. strengthen partnerships with these countries, uh, which are not U.S. allies in, in many cases, in ways that serve U.S. interests, but also honor these countries' wishes for foreign policy, independence, and, and flexibility. Uh, Ambassador Libert, did you want to take a stab at that one? Um, how long do you have? <laughs> and, uh, I don't really have a good answer. But um, I guess what I would say, I'll may maybe just uh, summarize it in, I think the best thing we can offer as the United States is a rules-based international order, right, that is fair, that is transparent, that is predictable, um, and that you can join, as it were, uh, or be an active member in without necessarily choosing sides. Mm -hmm. And I think for decades we've stood for that. And I think uh, it comes com coming back to Ambassador Kennedy's point, you know, we have domestic elections. Uh, there have been questions at times around that or about where we stand on, on that question. So I think it's just very important for us to continue uh, to project uh, a strong commitment to said rules-based international order, define it, keep it open, keep it transparent, keep it predictable, keep it fair. I think that's a very attractive thing uh, for some of these quote-unquote non-aligned people, non-aligned countries. But let me just get off the stage by, by also saying um, – I think our institutions matter in Asia. I, I would get a lot of questions in, in uh, Christie's part of the world uh, from Southeast Asian friends when I was assistant secretary uh, at the Pentagon, and it w they would go a little like this. Uh, in, this is when we were starting to have a lot of partisan fighting that I think has only intensified over the past decade, which is some, uh, the critique was, the thing that we're perhaps most concerned about is your institutions. You have institutions that have a history of solving great complex problems and you don't seem to be able to do that as effectively anymore and that undermines your strength as a nation right and th that is an interesting critique that i think all of us in government took seriously number one and number two out of government and as private citizens we should continue to focus on uh, going forward let me just stop there thank you ambassador kennedy yeah i you know, I think the the focus here, I don't think any of the nations, the very diverse nations of the Indo-Pacific, all of whom have different relations with us, and all of them speak different languages, have different geographical, cultural heritages, they don't want to choose between the United States and China. They want to have good relations. with well, China is an enormous market for them, an enormous large superpower as well, who they don't wish to offend. And by the way, the United States is looking to have the most stable, sensible competition with China that we can, something that doesn't veer off the rails. So I don't think we want them to have to choose. I strongly agree with Ambassador Lippert. Our selling points as the United States of America are the rules-based order and the fact that, by the way, American, for example, investors are bound by some of the same rules, the anti-corruption. When you get an American company, you know what you're getting, and you know how they treat their employees, the standards they must live by, 
And I think those are our real selling points for many countries. And they'll make their own choices, and I don't think we should force them into a competition because that's not healthy for anyone. But I think American companies and governments and private sector in, across the board can compete well in the Indo-Pacific because we have the strength of a rules-based order behind us, because we have the strength of strong, ethical, and important boundaries with which our investments and engagements are bound. Thank you. Yep. I'd, I'd agree with everything Mark and Christy said. I, I'd add maybe three points. One, we've already talked about the trade agenda. I think that's a really important thing where we're, we're missing out to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a second one would be infrastructure funding. Um, you all know that uh, many of the countries in the Indo-Pacific have benefited greatly from the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, it has its pluses and minuses, but one of the pluses is that they can deliver very, very quickly, and they're kind of a one-stop shop where they have the financing, they often bring uh, to the table and get things done very, very quickly. And, and in a place like Indonesia, they've helped really in a couple of years to develop a stainless steel industry. They've helped them with uh, all kinds of green processing. Uh, on the, the, the not so great side, it's, it's had a real, I think, very harmful effect on corruption because mostly these are state-owned enterprise to state-owned enterprise transactions that are very untransparent uh, and, and therefore have, have, I think, encouraged uh, uh, corruption. The second area is in, on in labor and environmental standards. And again, I think they've gone backwards in many cases in many of these countries because of what the Chinese do mm -hmm. there. And so that in turn has had an impact on our company's ability to, for example, negotiate critical minerals agreements with countries like, like Indonesia. So uh, I think we need to do better in terms of developing infrastructure financing. I would like to see uh, institutions like the Development Finance Corporation capitalized at a higher level so that they can do more because financing is a really, really important part of the game now. The third area I would say is soft power. Uh, if we have one great advantage over mm -hmm. China, it's in the soft power area. Mm -hmm. And we don't, I don't think we do quite enough, really, to encourage that. And, you know, all of us uh, as ambassadors, some of our favorite programs were the, the International Visitor Leadership Program, where we brought young leaders to the United States, um, various kinds of programs for students, or anything like that to, to bring people to the United States and help them understand, develop partnerships while they were here. All of those things were just money in the bank for us, and I would love to see more of those kinds of, of programs. Can, Mike, I just, oh, oh, sorry, can, can we go, go ahead? You go first, Mark, and then I'll Yeah, just, you. just two follow-ups to Bob's very good uh, intervention. Mm -hmm. um, one, I, let me just take the, the financing piece because it's something we've looked at extensively. Institutions like the Export-Import Bank are, I think, a little bit antiquated in that they have to, they are so dependent upon bankability standards mm -hmm. that they cannot act to close deals where the bankability may be a little more risky, <coughs> maybe a little bit more risky. But if you're in this competition, you have to be a little more risk acceptant, right? And mm -hmm. the president of the Export ba Import Bank, who's a Senate confirmed official and the board, they need to be able to have sufficient waiver authority to close some of these deals versus relying on, you know, very well-meaning civil servants who are just hidebound by the law, right? And I think we found ourselves, there are myriad of, of examples, but I just wanted to add on to the DFC example with the XM Bank. I think it's a, it's a real issue. Uh, the second, just in terms of soft power, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, in, in Korea this week, right, you see the the much ballyhooed, understandably so, uh, Major League Baseball opening between mm -hmm. the Padres and the Dodgers. Huge, huge yeah. success for the United, just by bringing those two teams there. Secretary Blinken's there, mm -hmm. uh, also uh, comes up against the Summit for Democracy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right? I mean, that is soft power defined and pulled off extremely well uh, by the Biden administration. But more, there is much more that could be done. And we, we, I think, as a government, struggle with how to get a handle around it, right? Mm -hmm. I, as is, and I'll get off the stage here by saying, same with the Korean government, right? They have this great K-pop, mm -hmm. so popular in Southeast Asia, all these great brands, K-brand, all this stuff, if you will. And they, they, they sometimes struggle, understandably so, just like us, with how to get a handle and use this very effective 
uh, tool in their toolbox of instruments for foreign uh, and national security policy. Yeah, so let me kind of chime in with what my two colleagues have said. Bob is absolutely right that the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative has so many advantages for countries seeking rapid development. You know, the, I'm thinking of the lower income countries of Southeast Asia principally, or South Asia as well, where the thought that somebody says, we can build you a new port in a year or a year and a half. And they don't ask the questions behind it. You know, when is this financing going to come due? What are the environmental standards? Are our workers even going to be used? Or is it your workers and your materials? The end result is a leader of a nation thinks, well, Jesus is great. Before the end of my term, I'm going to have a port. I'm going to have a road. I'm going to have a new industry. I'm not sure the United States is ever going to be built to directly combat that. It's simply not the way we, we aren't. Different kind of government, different kind of financing in our private sector make their own decisions. I do agree the U.S. government can and should do more to assist our private sector. Some of that can be as simple as helping make connections. I know the U.S. Secretary of Commerce has just had a trade and investment mission out in the Philippines, you know, on digital economy. These are great. We've got a lot of companies because a great American strength that we often forget is innovation. I used to sometimes speak to audiences when I was ambassador who would not necessarily be very as pro-American as one might like. And you'd say, can I ask a question? How many people in the room have an iPad or an iPhone? And every hand goes up. You know, this is American innovation. And that's where I think the US government could help connect American innovation and innovators with a lot of the con countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, that takes shoe leather, and that takes trade missions and time. But I think you know, we do have the capacity to help some American companies who may not have the international expertise to, to move into that zone. And finally, I want to sort of foot stamp the importance of soft power, which we can talk about more as we go along. But there, there is a great value to be had, for example, in, you know, baseball crazed Korea in having baseball openers there. I, I saw in the Philippines, which is a, a basketball crazed country, you know, bringing out a couple of former NBA stars to do some clinics, the coach of the Miami Heat, Eric Spolster, is a Filipino-American. He could have run for president after he ran <laughs> clinics out there. You know, the, the, but these are our connectors, and I do think that is, is a unique strength that our Chinese counterparts don't quite see or use. Ditto the amazing exchange programs. Uh, in my time in the Philippines, I was talking to a mayor in a small town in the southern Philippines, and he had just returned with 10 other Filipino mayors from visiting small or smaller American cities. And what they talked about is what mayors talk about, trash collection, schools, roads. And, and he said they all came back with so many great ideas and also were able to share some of theirs. And that's the kind of thing you, you can't replicate elsewhere. And I'd, I'd love to see the U.S. government do more of that. I realize it's labor intensive, it's funding intensive, but, but those are great programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Really interesting. And I'm glad that several of you mentioned the DFC, um, which is uh, something that's been very active, uh, in particular in South Asia, a region that I look at closely. And um, back in November, I believe the DFC committed a uh, very large investment, I think half a billion dollars, uh, for a port development project in Sri Lanka. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this has been cited uh, by a number of officials here as something that could provide a model for how to counter uh, BRI. So I, I, I had wanted to come back to the, the economic bit. I think you've all provided some really useful comments on that front. But before we move on um, to one more question, before we open it up to you all, do any of you want to add um, to this question of what might make an effective U.S. economic diplomacy or economic security strategy? Is there any type of thing you want to add to that? Yes. I could jump in. Um, I'd say a couple things. Um, I, obviously, in a perfect world, I'd love to see us rejoin TPP, now mm -hmm. called CPTPP. I don't think that's going to happen because there's just not congressional support for it. So we need to think realistically about what is possible. And I think that the two things that would really help in, in our part of the world in the Indo-Pacific, one would be um, uh, sectoral agreements. So I was thinking particularly of digital agreements where there's mm – -hmm. There's huge development of the digital economy in Southeast Asia. 
and many, many opportunities. The, the countries already are developing free trade agreements among themselves and with Australia and New Zealand and other countries. And it would make great sense for us to do this. There's already the, the language in the, the revised USMCA agreement that we could just sort of uh, graft onto an agreement for in Southeast Asia. So it wouldn't be that hard, I think, to get it through Congress. And, I, and so that, that's one. Another one are, are, is, again, is this very important critical minerals uh, task that we have ahead of us, where China is now locking up a lot of these critical minerals, both the minerals themselves, but also the processing of it. And so it's extremely important for us to get out and do more on this. And uh, again, these minerals are often in, in countries where we don't have a free trade agreement. And so um, the processing of, would not be eligible for uh, IRA tax credits here in the United States. So it is important to, de to develop these agreements, and I hope that the next administration will do that. The Biden administration is a little bit concerned now about labor and environmental standards in, in many of these countries and, and how that might impact our own elections. And so they've been a little bit careful about that, which is understandable, but I hope whichever administration takes office next, we'll, we'll take a look at that. that. That's one thing. The other one is I'd just like to mention climate. Um, I, I spent a year working on John Kerry's team, helping him to negotiate the Just Energy Transition Partnership with, with Indonesia. And one of, one of the areas that, that really came, came back to bite us a little bit was on the climate finance side. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time working on climate since then and went to the, the, the Dubai COP last year. And if there's one area where uh, I think everybody agrees the, the world needs to do more and the United States needs to do more, it's on climate finance. Mm. And uh, we found ourselves really kind of in a tin cup exercise, even within our own government, to figure out how we would come up with our share of the $10 billion that, uh, that G7 countries are going to provide for that agreement. So, uh, and most of it, by the way, was going to come from the, the DFC. But even that is somewhat limited. And so I, I think the, the climate, climate finance piece of this is going to be increasingly important around the Indo-Pacific. And if we can figure out creative ways to do that, my own view is largely through the DFC, but maybe AID as well, uh, that would help us a lot. And of course, it would help these countries to, to develop these, uh, these clean energy transitions. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'll chime in, and maybe Mark can wrap us up. Uh, obviously. It's not too surprising that the three of us are in pretty strong agreement on all of these issues. But particularly looking at Southeast Asia, where I spent eight years of my career as ambassador to two of the countries, Southeast Asia is young and they're wired. And so the digital economy not only matters immensely to them, it is also a way, even as the cell phone was a way to leapfrog over countries that were never going to get landlines down, the digital economy is a way to really accelerate growth and create huge opportunities. So I think the more that we can do as a U.S. government, but also as a U.S. private sector, to make that happen would be tremendous. Ditto, I saw an, an immense interest, particularly in some of the more developed countries of Asia, and some of the, the very developing aren't yet there, but in the environment and in climate, and, and really in the protection of their environment, and almost as a matter of national pride the oceans, um, you know, wildlife trafficking. We ended up putting together a great program with Thailand when I was there on anti-wildlife trafficking. Mm -hmm. And it was my smart team, not the ambassador, who came up and said, we're talking to a lot of people who want to do something on this. Can we, the U.S. government, be helpful? Uh, can we link up some U.S. organizations that could provide ranger training, for example, against poaching? You know, these are things we can do, and it requires a fair amount of creativity on our part. And, and finally, we haven't talked as much on the strategic side, but I think we shouldn't forget that piece. You know, we have important strategic relationships. We have five treaty allies in Asia. We run important multilateral military exercises that bring together militaries from across the region. And those are critical in getting them to talk to each other in the brief but important phase of democracy in Myanmar those meetings were a great place to bring in former Myanmar generals and, and help them understand how the rest of the region works. So I think we shouldn't ignore that even as we talk about economic development, soft power. The fact that 
we do have an engaged U.S. strategic component. And finally, I'd like to say, and I think it was Ambassador Blake who brought it up in the first place, you know, Deputy Secretary Kirk Campbell has really done a great job in expanding the Indo-Pacific to include the Pacific Island states. And if there's one challenge and opportunity at the same time for the United States, it is that the Indo-Pacific is broad, wide, deep. There are a great plethora of nations, and it's quite important for us to have relations with them all. It matters strategically and economically to us. And I think that's a trend I hope will continue. Thank you. Um, not a whole lot to add to the very good list. I just double tap on market access trade agreements, absolutely critical. And maybe the comment there is that there is a bipartisan blueprint for this, and it's the USMCA, <coughs> um, which was incredibly uh, well received in Congress. It took a lot of work, not to underestimate that, but labor came in, negotiated that. Um, so there, I think that's an interesting template from which you could conceivably launch. Uh, I think that's one. Two, digital trade and services, to, to echo the, the comments, are absolutely critical, absolutely essential, and I think also doable uh, as, as well. Um, the third one on my list that hasn't been mentioned, and this would be involve, a, I think, a grouping of much closer in allies, it's what the Koreans call Kyongjae uh, Anbo, uh, economic security. Those are the critical technologies. The semiconductors, 5G, um, biologics, we, we all know those lists, but getting alignment on what those core technologies are, because every country has different uh, lists, number one. Number two, sorting through, I think, in a coordinating way, not a state-directed way, but who's doing what, because different countries have different expertise, as we, as we heard from Senator Haggerty. The Japanese <coughs> do some things very well in this, the Koreans do others, um, the Dutch, other, just figuring that piece out and more emphasis there. We've done some good work uh, in this administration on that, but I think that's a, a real area where we could increase economic viability on technologies that really, really matter. Um, the, the fourth thing I would just uh, a little bit echo um, would, would Christy said about connectivity, but connectivity, especially among small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, these are the, the companies that do do a lot of the innovation that we are so good at in the United States, but don't necessarily have big government affairs teams mm -hmm. or international people sitting in capitals or all of that and need basic connectivity to, to do deals, right? And the government can help, help do that and more of an emphasis on the SME sector, which is also mm -hmm. vibrant in many of these Southeast Asian exactly. countries Exactly, they're very well. entrepreneurial. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's the piece. And let me just get off the stage by saying, look, if you're gonna do something strategic in Washington, I think in terms of, a, of an internal look, it would be just to pick up on the themes we've said, um, looking at your bureaucracies, XM Bank, DFC, um, and making sure that they are fit for purpose. Um, I think the DFC example is a good one, but DFC is limited on how much it can give, what, what countries, there are certain, you know, are those definitions appropriate uh, in this day and age? I've mentioned the XM Bank. There's a whole list of these, but is there an exercise by which we could go through and kind of make sure these are, are suited for purposes? And, and let me stop there. Can, can I, I add? Make, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Just, I just want to make one comment picking up on both what Christy and, and Mark said. I, again, if there's an, another big advantage that the United States has over China, it's our network of alliances, not around the world, but also in the Indo-Pacific. And I think that that's very, very important. And the Biden administration has done a good job uh, of restoring those, frankly, because they got into a little bit of disrepair during the Trump administration. Um, but, uh, in, in, but also looking to leverage those in important ways. And I'll give you a, a few examples. Um, one of the sort of least, least well-known, but I think important developments has been the improvement in relations between Japan and Korea. Mm -hmm. Mark, I'm sure you'll agree that's important. And um, we work a lot with those two countries, and they both enjoy uh, great respect in places like Southeast Asia. So it's very much to our benefit to work with them as much as possible, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of trust for Japan and, and Korea in, in those countries. Uh, likewise, I think that the Biden administration has done a really good job of doing more with the Quad. It's now become a presidential level mm -hmm. initiative and has some real uh, meat and some real initiatives behind it. 
Uh, and there's even talk of, of expanding the Quad to include, let's say, Korea or a country like that. So all of which I think would be to the good. So, so those, are, uh, those are areas that we need to continue to focus on and, again, work as much with these close partners and leverage that to our advantage. And I was going to add something that in an area for growth, I would say, in our relationship with the Asia-Pacific, and I would say that's on the health sector. Mm. You know, if we learned one thing from the pandemic, it is that in today's global world, you know, one, one person sneezes and we all get a cold. And so I, I think I'd love to see, and I know that the bandwidth is limited in the U.S. government. There's a lot going on, a lot to do. But I'd love to see us working with the nations of the Indo-Pacific, hugely populous nations, particularly some of the working with, say, the more developed, the Japans and the Koreans, see how we could build a partnership to build health capacity some of these countries. And we have a big presence of the Center for Disease Control in Southeast Asia. They do amazing work and have done for years. Can we look at how we can help these countries be prepared to respond if and when, and it's probably when, there is another pandemic? And, you know, I, I know that's an issue the United States ourselves are working on, but I think it's a great growth area for the Asia Pacific, mm. the Indo-Pacific, I should say. Uh, well, thank you to all of you. We, we've covered a lot of ground, uh, and I want to open things up to our audience. And I should say, for those of you watching online, um, please feel free to post your question uh, in the chat box, and we'll get to that. So do we have questions in the room first? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll start uh, down here. And sorry, if you could wait till you have the microphone so people online can, can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like uh, to ask uh, Ambassador Kenny to talk a bit about the somewhat perplexing relationship between the U.S. and Thailand. <laughs> I, after all, we, the military still has a significant role in government. There were elections, but they're somewhat strange elections. Uh, it, just please bring us up to date. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry you asked that because... <laughs> You know, every time you think U.S. politics is complicated, then you look at Thailand and it's really complicated. I mean, first of all, we have a very long historic relationship with Thailand, as you know. They are a treaty ally. They are one of our oldest allies. Hundred Now we're at 190 or 200 years of our friendship and relationship. And yet the Thai democracy is quite different. They've had, what, how many coups? A coup in 2006, a coup in 2014. And the military, by their new constitution, now plays a role. In the last election, as you say, the formation of a government looked unusual. They did succeed in forming a government, so probably not ours to, to say, but it was an unusual process that was engaged. You know, I think the key for us, though, as a government, even as we would hope people would do with the United States as we have elections, we put new people in, is to focus on our relationship, what matters about that relationship. Thailand is home, for example, to more than 1,000 U.S. companies. It's the Detroit of the East, if you will, with Japanese, Korean, and American auto manufacturers there. But American companies range from the people who make Mattel Hot Wheels trucks, and you have children who love those, on up to, to Ford, to cloud computing. So, you know, look at where we have strong partnerships. We have a very strong health relationship with the Thai. The Center for Disease Control has about 200, 300 people in Thailand co-located the Thai Health Ministry. You know, that's a partnership that transcends Thai politics. And one of the things we tried to do when I was in Thailand shortly after the military coup is, is look at where what links remain regardless of who's in government in Thailand or in the United States. The strategic par partnership is also an important one, the Thai you know, fly U.S. F-16s and F-15s. They buy U.S. military equipment. They host with us one of the world's largest multinational military exercises. So all of those issues remain strong, and it's important not to lose sight of them. Again, the politics in Thailand, I wish I could had a crystal ball and I could tell you where they're going, what they're doing. I don't have with my own country, let alone Thailand. One of the great Thai experts once told me, if you think you understand Thai politics, you're wrong. <laughs> Other questions? Um, yes, over here. Um, hi, Akshat Singh uh, from the India Chat at CSIS. Uh, congratulations on the new program, Michael. Uh, my question is for Ambassador Blake. Uh, so you talked about uh, how there are environmental concerns which are impacting uh, the U.S.'s 
uh, ability to negotiate critical minerals agreements uh, with Indonesia. Could you expand a little on that? Um, also, given the fact that if there is a tighter enforcement of environmental uh, regulations, that would mean that the minerals will become less price competitive as compared to China. Some solutions to that? Sure. So uh, I was talking specifically with respect to Indonesia. And there, um, I've actually myself tried to bring in American mining companies. And uh, they, they want two things before they're going to invest in Indonesia. First, they want to be sure that their exports will be to the United States of whatever's processed in Indonesia would be eligible for, for, for Inflation Reduction Act tax credits. And then secondly, that, that they would be able to access renewable energy for these huge energy intensive projects because many of these mining companies have their own net zero 2050 targets now that they have to meet. Um, in the first case of these tax credits, um, it, as I said, there, w there would have to be a critical minerals agreement because we do not have a free trade agreement with Indonesia. And uh, to do that, um, we'd have to get that through Congress as well. And right now, there's a lot of concern in Congress, I mean, rightly so, about labor and environmental standards, mostly because it's Chinese companies who have been developing these projects so far, and they have not pursued high labor and environmental standards. So it, project after project has these horrendous stories of fish kills and groundwater pollution and air pollution and many kinds of worker safety issues. Uh, and, and those are serious concerns. So I think there's, there's a way forward where we could put sort of certain minimum standards in place that would be a requirement for uh, any company that might be eligible for Inflation Reduction Act tax credits. Um, but even so, it's going to be a little bit of a lift in, in the current Congress with, with uh, our elections coming up. So for the moment, the Biden administration is doing the smart thing, which is to set in place the, the dialogues and so forth to, to hopefully be ready to act in, in a second administration or even in a Trump administration. I think uh, President Trump also understands the need to, to diversify our sources of supply and not have uh, China controlling that. So. So I, I wouldn't discount that possibility under them either. Mm. Hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, looks like Kent has his hand up again. Please, yes, go ahead. Terrific panel. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Kent Hughes, a fellow at the program at the Wilson Center here. One of you mentioned the Young Leaders Program, where we brought people from really around the world to see how America worked and so forth. During the Cold War, there was a real emphasis on language study and area studies. Uh, there was even a National Defense Foreign Language Program. Is there anything like that going on in the administration? We could do much the same thing with regard to the whole Indo-Pacific. I'll start by tackling. I'm not sure there's a whole systemic, but we do do some English language instruction through a couple of avenues. One is our Peace Corps volunteers in some of the developing countries in, in the Indo-Pacific who often do teach English or teach English teachers, which I think in some ways is even more effective. Rather than trying to teach individual students, you help train the trainers. And we also do run through the State Department, the former USIA. We do have English language fellows who help look at these programs. But I, I'm not aware that we do much of that anymore. And again, part of the problem is I think it's resource intensive in terms of both people and monies, and it's a question of how much you can do on any of that. I'd say that's the same problem with all of these people-to-people -people exchanges, which are, are wonderful. They're, they're gold in every way, bringing young leaders and connecting them with Americans in the same sector they're in, in the same field. But I think it's, it's hard to ever have the funding to bring as many as you'd like from all of the countries. And there are linguistic issues, as, as you wisely point to, that makes that hard to do, too. I, I would just add two things. I think, first of all, many of the countries in the region are adding English language instruction into their primary and secondary education, because they understand that if they, have to, if they want to be internationally competitive, their young people have to speak English. So we are seeing that. But um, I'll give you another interesting example. Indonesia is one of the countries where they haven't done enough to promote English. And w that was a real problem for us in terms of trying to promote uh, American universities in Indonesia mm -hmm. because they just couldn't pass the tests in many cases. And so um, what, what we've done is to encourage them to go to community colleges for two years. And 
uh, those are easier to get into to begin with, and they can beef up their English language skills for two years. They're also cheaper than going to a, a four-year school. And uh, a little known fact is that it's actually easier to transfer into a very good school like University of California at Berkeley as a transferee than it is to apply as a freshman. So, so a lot of Indonesian students have, have done a very good job of that and end up graduating from a great place like Berkeley after they've gotten that first two years of instruction in, in, a, in a community college somewhere. So, so that's been quite an interesting and, and positive uh, way forward. And one other comment. And part of the question was Americans learning Asian languages, mm-hmm. right, and going out in the old National Security Education Program at DOD, which I'm sort of old enough to have looked at and uh, considered applying for. Um, but I, I think um, on there, you know, I, I don't think there – I don't think there is enough focus. I think there could be more. Uh, what I am encouraged is, well, let me, one. Two, though, there is a lot more interest, right, in Asian languages. I'm on the board of the Korea Society, for example, and interest in Korean language is, like, tripled, uh, mm-hmm. quadrupled. Now, numbers were small, but the interest is there, right, and growing. Um, the capacity lags on these private sector initiatives, piecemeal, It's hodgepodge. It's gotten a little better uh, because of uh, the pandemic uh, basically facilitating more virtual learning. Mm -hmm. But it is very scattershot. And I'll I'll end by just saying, um, you know, an example uh, of my own uh, son, right? I mean, he spoke Korean when he came back. He was two years old. He understood it. Let's put it that way. And I ended up, you know, having to drive him out to Olney, Maryland, uh, to to try to do the Saturday Korean school, and that's been and that's a challenge, right? You have to make a real commitment to do that. Um, I did. We did find. Uh, we we moved to Minnesota. I live in Minnesota now, and we did find, interestingly enough, a lot of offerings um, among certain Minnesota public schools for Chinese, especially. So he's in Chinese immersion now. Um, there's that's growing. And I think, to me, the answer lies much more at the elementary and secondary levels than kind of these programs that are expensive late in life and just aren't as effective. I think the more we can do younger uh, on the way up, the better off uh, they'll be going forward. Let me stop there. That's great. Thank you. And I just wanted to share a a notable observation made by one of our online um, viewers, uh, Melanie Bixby, a senior advisor at uh, the State Department. She says that on economic and soft power issues, The State Department has launched PPPs to get more women into the energy sector and the economy in East and Southeast Asia, including through APEC. She says that state needs to coordinate its missions with uh, chambers of commerce to collaborate on linking opportunities and uh, U.S. uh, beneficiaries. Um, We have time for one more question, if there is one. Uh, You had your hand up first there in the back. Uh, Actually, if they're very quick, we could get to both of them. So you ask yours first, and then we'll come up here. Please make it brief. I will. Um, my name is David Gossick. I'm currently a consultant, but in a past life, had the pleasure of working with two of your panelists. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, given your vast experience, um, the Biden administration overall has done, I think, a remarkable job in renewing engagement across the region uh, and bringing a whole-of-government approach with a one or two notable exceptions. My question is, do you have any recommendations looking forward for how we can build continuity between administrations in keeping this kind of engagement and not face what we've seen in the past where um, administrations change and priorities for this region tend to uh, vacillate? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, pass the mic up two rows. Yeah, right here. Can, uh, let me take a start at that. Please, go ahead. And I think part of that is that it's always a mistake to rely solely on government to make links between countries. The think tank community, the university community, the business community, the NGO community, there are a lot of different communities who are deeply and intensely interested in the Asia-Pacific region, in the Indo-Pacific region. And I think I would hope that those links continue. If you're an American business looking to do business in Southeast Asia, looking to do business in the Indo-Pacific, you're going to keep doing that. And I would hope that governments encourage that. Universities, Bob Blake mentioned universities. You know, we've seen a lot in my time as ambassador of American universities very interested 
in some kind of connection with overseas universities, both as a source for students, but as an exchange, professorial exchanges. The online community actually assists in that facility. So that's one way I think we can help build some insulation around potential changes in administration, or even if not changes, disruptions while governments get themselves organized here in the United States after elections. Thanks. Let's take the other question. Yep. Uh, 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 thank you, uh, uh, the panelists, terrific. And uh, so I have one um, short question. Like as you ma mentioned, uh, the strategic significance of the Indo-Pacific region is increasing. And uh, in some cases, the uh, United States has to uh, overlook what is going on on the domestic front, as you mentioned, about the, the Thailand cases. And uh, so with the region's growing strategic significance and the U.S.'s uh, application of value-based foreign policy and human rights advocacy has also become more selective, uh, which raised some questions about its moral standings oftentimes. So my question is, how can the U.S. rebalance its uh, strategic interest to its, with its uh, uh, value in the, in the Pacific region? Thank you, too. Good but tough questions. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to uh, offer a brief last, comment? I didn't either. The last Reserve. part of the question. It, how can what? Essentially, the, the values-based uh, issue. How can the U.S. pursue its Indo-Pacific strategy given perceptions in the region that the U.S. is selective about how it applies its values-based foreign policy? All in, all in one minute. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at this because it's a very good question but deserves a longer answer. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just give one part of it, which I do think a little bit plays to my bias, 10 years on Capitol Hill. Um, the Congress plays an important role in continuing to in ensure that the executive branch, I think, um, focuses on um, a human rights and, and values-based. Congress created the Bureau of Human Rights and uh, Democracy at the State Department. It's always been I think speaking as, as someone who's been on both sides, spent time in both the executive and legislative branch, I think it's always been more forward leaning on these questions mm -hmm. and is an important and I think unique part of our democracy that can really play an important role in making sure that those very valid, important universal rights have the appropriate place in U.S. foreign policy going forward. Let me mm -hmm. stop there. That was great. Under a minute. Yeah, I, I think pretty hard to disagree with that. I do want to just take issue with your one point. We're not overlooking Thai issues or internal issues. It is that they've had elections. They formed a parliamentary government. It came out in a unique fashion. But for a long-term alliance, you sometimes have to think not only look at the short term and, and a principle of not interfering in a legitimate parliamentary government and look long-term at where you can work together. I would just add, you know, that um, it, it is true that in places like in India and elsewhere, we, we talk less publicly about uh, our various concerns on, on human rights issues. But privately, I can assure you, our governments are still hard at work on uh, working on mm -hmm. these issues. And what we try to do in, in all of these cases is to help them understand why it's in their own interest to do the things that we're asking them to do. Because in the end, it's going to help increase the support of the government. It's going to help uh, advance stability. It's, there, there are many, many good arguments for uh, doing more to promote things like uh, anti-corruption efforts, uh, promoting religious freedom, promoting all kinds of human rights concerns. So. So I can assure you the State Department is still hard at work on these issues. Sometimes for pragmatic reasons, they don't talk about it publicly as much. But um, I, you know, I don't want you to think that this has fallen off the agenda. I, it, it, it is not. Yeah, that's a good point. And often, to be honest with you, if you've got a good working relationship with a country, a long partnership, these are issues best addressed privately. Yeah, you can feel good if you make a speech for five minutes, but you've backed them into a corner. Vice, a private dialogue where you're saying, Here's what we're seeing. Here's why it's in your interest. We're talking to you as a friend. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, 
just in wrapping up, uh, I meant to mention this earlier. I think it was you, Ambassador Blake. You had mentioned this notion of a network of alliances. Uh, have to put in a plug. The Wilson Quarterly, our, our journal here, uh, its winter 2024 issue focuses on the new multilateralism, which gets into a lot of these issues. It's a great read if you haven't seen it already. This has been a terrific conversation. Uh, we need to wrap up. I want to thank uh, our three panelists for terrific uh, contributions. Uh, we're going to adjourn briefly. We're going to have a 10-minute break. At 10.15, we will continue our, uh, our program. So thank you. Let's have a round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. So we're going to co continue our conversation. Uh, this time we're going to focus perhaps more on economic issues. And it's really my great pleasure to be able to welcome um, Ambassador Murray uh, to the stage. Um, Ambassador Murray is the U.S. Senior Official for APEC at the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs at the State Department. He's had this role since February of 2022. And um, he, his career at the State Department has focused on US economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And he's done that through a number of very high profile positions, including um, as the State Department's Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary of uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Trade Policy and Negotiations. Um, he's also served as Minister Counselor for Economic Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Uh, he's been Counselor for Economic Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Canberra. Uh, he's had a diplomatic postings in Shanghai, Dar es Salaam, and New Delhi as well. Um, it's wonderful to have you join us today, Ambassador, and let me get to um, this discussion about APEC. We had the APEC summit in San Francisco in November. There were many highlights to um, the summit meeting. We've had a shared statement that came out, the Golden Gate Declaration by the economic leaders about a sustain resilient and sustainable future for all. Uh, the release of the San Francisco principles on integrating inclusivity and sustainability on trade and investment policy. But we've also seen some divergences and some controversy about to what extent there is consensus. So I'm, I, I'm <coughs> hoping that you could put this in perspective. What did San Francisco mean? Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, and I think to start with, uh, maybe the good best starting point is with what you're doing today in launching the Indo-Pacific program, uh, because I think this is a really important development here at the Wilson Center. And if you go back two years, I started in this role, as you said, in February of 2022. Uh, that month was a big month. It was the month that uh, the president released the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, one of the pillars of which uh, was on driving prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. I started my job on February 1st, and then on February 8th, it was announced that we would host uh, APEC in 2023. Uh, so from the earliest days uh, of my role in this job, the, the White House, the Secretary of State, uh, and other leadership really emphasized to us you know, what our marching orders were, which was that hosting APEC would be an important part of the Indo-Pacific Strategy's economic prosperity pillar. It was a chance to show leadership in the region at a time when the region uh, was really looking for U.S. leadership. And, um, you know, it would be an opportunity to listen to our partners about the kind of agenda that they wanted to take forward in APEC uh, through, through the host year. And so we did do uh, a very concerted job of going around and trying to listen to what other economies were looking for. And I think particularly uh, coming out of the, the COVID pandemic, coming out of some of the uncertainty that we had faced, you know, we really heard universally from a lot of the economies that, uh, you know, economic growth needed to be on a more sustainable footing, it needed to be on a more resilient footing, and it needed to be uh, more focused on inclusion and in really including all communities so that they could benefit from that growth. And so we moved forward and designed an agenda for our APEC host year uh, around those three uh, big topics. And I think, um, you know, APEC obviously is a whole year long endeavor. Uh, we hosted 10 ministerials across five different cities in the United States, uh, you know, across an 11 month period. But even the most hardy APEC watchers really only focus on it uh, at the summit in November. Mm -hmm. And so uh, during APEC Economic Leaders Week, I think what we tried to do, as you just noted, was uh, bring home some consensus 
Um, again, if you look at the APEC economies, 21 economies that make up half of global trade and 60% of the world's GDP, but uh, very different situations across the board. Uh, and so trying to get consensus in a leader's declaration around issues like integrating inclusivity and sustainability into trade and investment policy, uh, on issues like advancing a just energy transition, uh, advancing sustainable agri-food systems, creating some coordination around disaster management, uh, and then also uh, at the ministerial level, moving forward with some outcomes on um, uh, anti-corruption, on cloud computing, on uh, you know, uh, education and training for the workforce. And so on that basis, kind of looking at the, the APEC piece alone, uh, I think uh, we were successfully able to work with our partners to get to some good outcomes in San Francisco, despite all of the other challenges that I know we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, but there's other two other very important goals for the week in San Francisco, obviously. Uh, one was, as has always been the case over the last three plus decades, APEC is a place that can serve as a platform for important bilateral engagements. And obviously, the meeting between President Biden and President Xi was an incredibly important part of the week. It landed right in the middle of the week uh, on, on the Wednesday. Um, and I think that the fact that it was as positive as it was and, and, and kept the, the lines of communication open between the United States and the PRC also had some real tailwind of benefits for the leaders meeting itself uh, for APEC on Thursday and Friday. And then also the opportunity to use APEC as a platform to, to focus on other regional economic engagements. And so as everybody saw, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, was announced that three of the four pillars had been substantially concluded um, in, you know, by the time of San Francisco, and so using it for those kinds of opportunities as well. And so from our perspective, across the whole range of what we had hoped to achieve in San Francisco, I think there were a lot of uh, positive outcomes uh, that came from it. And now we carry that forward in what we hope is a stronger, uh, institutionally stronger APEC headed into now Peru's host year in 2024, so that we can continue to focus on many of these key issues uh, going forward. Great. Let me begin by asking about the membership. It's 21 economies, not countries. Um, the members include uh, governments like Taiwan. Um, we have seen the chairman's statement um, focus not just on economic issues, but also on quite politically sensitive issues, including Ukraine. Um, and there was a deliberate note stating that not all member uh, economies were in agreement with this. To what extent does this forum provide an opportunity to actually deal with some of the most pressing issues in the in the, the region, but at the same time, by going in too much into the politically sensitive, are we risking diverging these economies still further? So I think the most complicated issue in this regard when it comes to APEC is uh, the Russia-Ukraine issue. Uh, because, of course, Russia is an APEC member. They've been an APEC member since 1998. Uh, I said a moment ago that February 2022 was a big month uh, for our engagement in APEC. It also, unfortunately, was the start of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so, you know, this is also something that our team has been dealing with for the last two years in collaboration with other interagency partners on, on how to address it. Uh, we've also worked with many of our like-minded partners in APEC uh, to call out uh, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. APEC, uh, over the last three plus decades, its DNA has been to focus on economic issues and to, uh, to try not to get weighed into geopolitics. Uh, but obviously, when you have one of the members of the organization that's involved in something like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and you see the significant spillover in economic costs uh, for the region, whether that's related to food security or energy security or just macroeconomic stability, uh, you know, we have felt very strongly about calling that behavior out and trying to uh, include uh, statements about Russia-Ukraine uh, in statement language. In 2022, uh, Thailand's host year, a very difficult year, they did ultimately get uh, some um, uh, language in the leader statement condemning uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which was similar to what we had seen in the G20 in Bali uh, a couple weeks before that, or a couple days before that. Um, and then this last year, when we were hosting, it again became a real challenge. And it also became an even bigger challenge towards the end of the year when we had also the situation in the Middle East and uh, economies wanting to uh, to comment on that conflict as well. 
Uh, and so that's where uh, that chair statement that you referenced uh, came in, in terms of noting the impact of some of these geopolitical situations on economic growth uh, in the region and continuing to express concern about one of our members uh, being engaged in a, in a war uh, with, its, with its neighbor. And so, you know, that is one, one set of issues. Mm -hmm. I think the other set of issues that you uh, talked about uh, is, you know, yes, APEC is uh, known, the members are known as economies rather than countries because uh, you do have 21 members, which include uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, there is always going to be um, some friction that plays out on the cross-strait relationship that plays itself out in, in APEC. Uh, the U.S. position is very clear on that, that uh, Taiwan participating as Chinese Taipei is a full and equal member of APEC, and we want to, con to see them be able to participate um, to the, de the degree that they want to participate. Um, we, uh, I made two trips to Taipei last year uh, to meet with, uh, with President Tsai and other members of the cabinet in, uh, in Taipei to talk about our APEC host year and how we could best engage um, uh, Taiwan. Uh, they did, as has been their practice, send a leader's representative, Morris Chong, uh, to San Francisco. But importantly, also in the other 10 ministerials uh, throughout the year, they sent uh, nine ministers and one vice minister. So very high level engagement. And they were able to use those opportunities to do other uh, you know, bilateral engagements here in the United States. And so that will continue to be a tricky issue. It will continue to be uh, difficult to manage. But we operate uh, you know, based on you know, that APEC understanding that all 21 economies are, are equal members and will continue to voice support uh, for Taiwan in that way. Mm. So the sideline meetings, the bilaterals, um, the trilaterals, those meetings are equally important. And with the San Francisco meeting, we did pay a great deal of attention to the US-China summit meeting. This was seen as an, a rapprochement, between, an, an opening of, of uh, greater communication uh, between the two countries. And from Beijing's perspective, I believe it's really been seen as an opportunity to move forward and focus on some of the issues that the two countries share. Have we seen much progress between these two countries since? And how do you think the agenda setting, the, that kind of improvement um, between the relations between Beijing and Washington will be reflected in the upcoming APEC meeting? So certainly, I think you said it very well there that you know the goal of that uh, meeting between President Biden and President Xi to be about keeping the lines of communication open and throughout 2023, there were a number of opportunities to do just that with the visits by Secretary Blinken and Secretary Yellen and Secretary Raimondo to China, as well as the visit by uh, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi here to the United States. And, you know, there's still a number of different uh, conversations ongoing between the United States and China uh, since November. And so we do want to make progress on some of the issues uh, that they discussed uh, in that meeting. And I think that we've certainly seen in the, in the APEC context, uh, you know, you can tell for sure based on the interactions with uh, our Chinese counterparts, um, you know, how the bilateral relationship is doing at that particular moment in time. You know, I think we have a fairly, I have a fairly good relationship with my PRC counterpart. I meet with her uh, at every single APEC meeting. We also speak uh, virtually. We just did a, a couple weeks ago. And so, um, you know, we'll continue those conversations to see how can we also build on that momentum in the APEC context uh, to see what, what we can get done. Um, I think it was very good. I don't know how many people saw it, but uh, the day after the meeting, President Biden spoke at the APEC CEO summit and I thought did a very uh, t you know, terrific job of highlighting, um, you know, in terms of our engagement with the region, how uh, the China piece fit in how our relationship, you know, wanting to bolster our relations with like-minded partners and allies fit in, and then also, you know, our own domestic situation and how we want to drive economic growth uh, in the region for the benefit of all of our people here in the United States, as well as um, the economies of the region. And so, you know, it was, I think, a very effective way of, of weaving in as well um, this China piece. And, and obviously, um, at uh, the APEC leaders meeting, there was a lot of uh, commentary by other economies as well on, um, you know, being happy and, and uh, very uh, gratified to see the United States and China getting together at that kind of level. 
And I guess the last thing I, I would just point out, too, is that um, obviously the President Xi's uh, meeting with President Biden got uh, the lion's share of the attention on the, on the bilateral, trilateral side. But it was a really busy week. Uh, we also had uh, President, uh, then President Jokowi from Indonesia, who was in Washington on his way to San Francisco. Uh, we had a bilateral meeting between President Biden and, and uh, the president of Mexico. Uh, we had uh, a number of engagements the Secretary of State had with um, the uh, 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 Philippines signing a one, two, three agreement uh, with uh, Trilat with Japan and Korea. Um, and then, you know, as well, uh, the IPEF uh, opportunity uh, with leaders. So uh, it was a very busy uh, week and, and a lot of opportunities uh, to engage uh, bilaterally, trilaterally, and in, in smaller groups, which is a great thing, great opportunity that APEC provides. Right. So I want to ask about the CEO summit. Um, Biden, uh, President Biden uh, gave a speech at the summit meeting. Uh, you talked about Morris Chang, the chairman of TSMC, the, the Taiwanese um, chip making conglomerate. Um, what is the role that the private sector plays in, in all of this? Right now, my understanding is that they are, in terms of representation at APEC, you have the CEO summit meeting and you have the separate leadership summit meeting as well. But there is a convergence. We talk about mm -hmm. the, the need for greater cooperation. And certainly when we talk about the need for innovation or creating economic opportunities, we cannot have that siloed, right? Are there opportunities for greater overlap? Can APEC be that forum? Yep. Yes. So I, you know, one of the things I love about APEC is there is that really key opportunity for public-private sector collaboration. And this was really one of our goals going into the year. I had uh, worked on APEC in 2011 um, at, when I was working in the office of Undersecretary Hormats at the time. And, um, you know, I had seen firsthand how you could, in a U.S. host year, really bring government and private sector together for some strong outcomes. But I think what we had seen over the last few years, and, you know, APEC had had a rough few years, right? You had the COVID years where it was online. Uh, in 2019, Chile was not able to host the leaders meeting because of domestic situation there. In 2018, Papua New Guinea was hosting and, and had some challenges. And so it had been a while, we felt like, since there had been a really strong public-private engagement, uh, not only at the CEO Summit and in Leaders Week, but also throughout the APEC year. And so that really became a priority for us. Uh, I often would refer to the public-private sector collaboration as being the secret sauce of what makes APEC special. Because since APEC is a consensus-based, non-binding organization, since it is multi-tiered, uh, goes from leaders to ministers to senior officials to working groups, there are a lot of opportunities for the private sector to have a voice in saying, you know, what if we did, uh, you know, made, made some agreements around this? What if we made some agreements around that? Um, and so we also wanted the CEO Summit to be a showcase of that and have the opportunity for leaders to literally walk across the street um, to the CEO Summit to be able to engage with the private sector. Um, my first visit to San Francisco in our host year was in January uh, as we started the preparations and the planning. Um, and I went out there with only one talking point, which was that the CEO Summit needed to be next door to where leaders were meeting because we wanted to make it as accessible as possible just so that we could have that platform for really strong public-private sector collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think we achieved that just before this meeting. I just came from meeting with the private sector to talk about our Peru year. Um, and so we want to keep that rolling in 2024. Yeah. And I think, you know, as, as an aside, who attended the various dinners that the leaders were hosting was very closely scrutinized and seen as, a, as an insight into what kind of investments can move forward in different countries and, and which sectors are deemed critical by, by different um, governments as well. So, so it's, that's really interesting that you actually also physically Yep. relocated and, and it's I, very important. I, I was actually there like the week before and I did see that so, so that's well done. <laughs> um, talking about um, you know, the, the people could argue that the diversity in the membership could be a weakness as well as a strength. Let's focus on the positive aspects of this. Um, there is this diversity of view, there is this opportunity for private public partnerships to emerge the global south, um, addressing the middle income trap that mm -hmm. many countries, especially in Southeast Asia, are trying to get out of. How is that agenda being addressed by APEC at the moment? 
Yeah, I think when I started this job two years ago, you know, one of the remarkable things uh, that I, I felt like I heard from talking to members, uh, including from the Global South, was a pretty universal uh, agreement on what some of the problems were. And again, it's important to remember that was when we were coming out of the COVID pandemic and, um, you know, there was a lot more focus on the climate crisis and there was a lot of concern about um, people not equally benefiting from uh, some of the growth that was happening. And so when you talk to Peru, when you talk to Chile, when you talk to our ASEAN members, when you talk to Papua New Guinea, I, I think all of them, again, they wanted to, they, they were saying very clearly, we need growth to be on a more sustainable footing. We need it to be on a more resilient footing and we need it to be more inclusive. And so that was really a, a big part of our focus. Now, I think where the divergence comes in, where the challenges come in, is what do you actually do about that? Uh, and so, you know, the nice thing about APEC, again, is to take to, to put it on in a positive uh, way, APEC, you know, is a consensus-based non-binding organization. So you can push the envelope a little bit more in APEC than maybe you can in a, in a treaty organization. And so uh, to be able to do that uh, and say, all right, well, what are some of the things we can do around sustainability? for example. And I give huge credit to Thailand because Thailand in 2022, as I said, APEC had had a few rough years. It was just coming out of the COVID pandemic. And what did Thailand do? Thailand said, if we're, if we're serious about putting APEC on a more sustainable footing, then we need some goals around how we do that and, and what are some of the things that we can do as an organization to make that happen. And so their signature uh, achievement in 2022 was, were the Bangkok goals on biocircular green economy. And it really, um, as I described it to Secretary Blinken, you know, really put sustainability uh, on, you know, uh, as a uh, basically a, a platform for everything that we're doing in, in APEC, um, that there has to be a sustainability uh, goal attached to it. And so I think that was very important. Um, and but I think that it is really important that we are continuing to engage with uh, like Peru, Papua New Guinea. Um, some of the smaller economies, uh, and Peru has taken on the leadership role of, of hosting APEC this year. And so, um, you know, how can we turn what could be a shortcoming into a strength? Um, I think if you designed APEC today, you know, you might not come up with the same 21 members, but, um, you know, these members have been with us for 25 years, and I think there's strength in that institutionally as well in that uh, you know, we now are three plus decades into this experiment and it's you know, gotten past the Asian financial crisis, past 9-11, past the global financial crisis, past now the COVID pandemic, and is still uh, serving as a convener to bring, uh, to bring people together from around the region. And my understanding too is that despite the continued you know, sources of tension, no, government, no economy has actually left and abandoned APEC. Correct, time, right? yep. We've been the same members since 1998. Okay. And that is, again, a source of strength as well. It is non-binding. Um, however, it is an opportunity to get together, not just for the summit meeting, but for this agenda as well. I'm going to have to turn to some of the um, disappointments um, of the APEC meeting and specifically turn to IPEF and the um, the inability for the United States to push through with the trade pillar on, on IPEF. What role can APEC play in ensuring that digital trade becomes part of the, uh, the agenda for these 21 member co uh, governments? Um, and where can consensus lie? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to note that w between APEC and IPEF, there are 12 members in common. So um, aside from India and Fiji, the other, the other 12 members of IPEF are all members of APEC as well. And I think that when you looked at the four pillars of IPEF, there was a lot of complementarity uh, between what IPEF was trying to do and, and what APEC was trying to do. And again, you know, last year with hosting APEC, you know, having the privilege to travel around the United States, which is something that uh, State Department diplomats don't always get to do as much as maybe we should. And, you know, being able to hear directly from people around the U.S. about uh, you know, what they're looking for from their international economic policy. And, and like a lot of the other economies in, in APEC, it was, we want more sustainable growth. We want more resiliency. Um, we need to address supply chain challenges, for example. Uh, we want to make sure that all communities are included. Uh, we, we are looking for jobs and good jobs, jobs of the future type jobs. 
and uh, you know how can we encourage more investment in the United States? Um, you know that, that can make that happen. And so you know I think when you look at the the IPEF pillars uh, across the board, there are the three that were substantially concluded by November. Uh, there was the supply chain pillar, the decarbonization pillar or clean economy pillar, and then the fair economy pillar on anti-corruption and tax. Um, again, that matches very well with what we're hearing from a lot of the other economies in APEC, as well as our own population, about wanting a more sustainable, more resilient, more inclusive uh, growth. And so I think it's important to note, too, that those pillars that have been concluded uh, will also help facilitate trade in the region um, in terms of engagement with uh, other, other economies. And, and I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, it also is important to note that um, all of that was achieved in just 18 months. Uh, the president traveled uh, to the region in May of 2022, and he announced uh, that we were going to launch uh, the negotiations. And 18 months later, you know, concluded three of the pillars and continue to engage on, on the other one. So I think, um, you know, that's a very, uh, I think, an important achievement uh, in a very short amount of time. Certainly, there are lots of things that we can all do uh, through APEC and through other uh, mechanisms, um, you know, uh, bilaterally and regionally uh, to try to, you know, continue the conversation as well on, um, you know, digital trade, for example, and, and some of the other topics and, and try to, uh, again, be complementary in, in the way we go forward. Um, but, you know, I think uh, given the, the time that, that they had getting to the result that we did, uh, I think was a, was a good result to, to get to by San Francisco. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I do want to remind those that who are watching us online, there is a chat box below, so you can submit your questions um, online as well. Um, I'd now like to turn over to the audience here at the Wilson Center. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and a microphone will make its way to you. Yes. Yes, uh, my name is Roberta Lajo. I am a retired ambassador from Mexico. Uh, what would it take to to bring TTP back from the dead? <laughs> well, of course, the you know other members uh, have continued forward with the CPTPP uh, and continue to advance that that agreement. You know, I think here in the United States, um, you know, as has been discussed uh, for the last couple of years, uh, there are certainly you know domestic challenges to being able to. Uh, for the United States to be able to, to rejoin uh, TPP. Uh, certainly, there are a lot of conversations that have happened uh, during the course of the administration with other partners who may wish for the United States to do that. I think that um, certainly with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, with our leadership in APEC, with other um, engagements that we've done through the Quad and, and also bilaterally, we just had Secretary Raimondo out uh, in the Philippines last week on the Presidential Trade and Investment Mission. There are certainly a lot of ways in which we continue to you know, advance uh, that trade agenda uh, throughout the region. Uh, but in terms of the United States rejoining uh, now the now reconstituted CPTPP, uh, you know, I don't think there's any plans to do that in the near term. Uh, yes. Thank you. Piper Campbell, another recovering ambassador. Matt, thank you very much. It strikes me, so I sort of have two questions linked. Part One is building on the previous question. In the past panel, there was a number of references to USMCA as an agreement to which the US has signed, which has some elements that might be interesting in terms of looking at the Indo-Pacific as well. And I wonder if you feel like that's something that's possible within either the format of IPEF or APEC or something else. And that question about this multiplicity of, of different arrangements le then leads to my next question, which is it's kind of challenging that you have a formation of IPEF, which is different from APEC, which is different from the East Asia Summit. Um, and at what point does sort of this multiplicity of different types of minilaterals and groupings become a problem in and of itself as opposed to a strength? 
Well, I think on the multiplicity of groupings, I mean, th obviously for 15, 20 years, I mean, having this conversation around uh, some of the regional preferential trade agreements and everything, and just looking at the, the region where you have not only TPP, but you also have RCEP. Um, there's also a, a China, Japan, Korea trilat. There's also the engagements through ASEAN. Uh, Australia also has a number of FTAs in the region. Um, Peru has talked about how their membership in APEC has really helped facilitate uh, FTAs and minilaterals and things that they've been able to join as well, uh, and they're still in the CPTPP. So, you know, I think there's certainly a lot of, uh, um, you know, different opportunities out there. I think for, you know, starting IPEF was looking at, you know, a new opportunity with a new set of partners. And again, trying to be responsive to, uh, you know, what are a lot of people in a lot of these economies focused on right now uh, in terms of those four pillars. I think, again, I go back to early 2022 coming out of the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, trade didn't stop because of tariffs in 2020. Trade stopped because of supply chain challenges, uh, which when you look out across a lot of these agreements, uh, they don't have anything on supply chains. And so IPEF offers uh, a first of its kind supply chain pillar, uh, which I think, again, I don't, you know, I'm sure you had a similar experience in your career. You go home and you start talking to the family about what you do as an economic officer at the State Department and people nod off and fall asleep. But when I came home and said I was working on supply chains, people paid attention, right? Like that was a, that was a big deal. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it. I think also, you know, looking at how do we address environmental and, and climate issues and a lot of trade agreements. Um, you know, I think that's something that, that IPEF certainly wanted to do. And then also looking at the the fair economy side. Um, but I, so IPEF was really more about a more comprehensive sort of economic engagement with the region. And so, you know, I think to that, in that way, um, it, it did, you know, with the three pillars being concluded in such a short amount of time, it did, uh, you know, accomplish uh, something there that was, that was unique. And the conversations continue on, on the trade pillar as well. I think in terms of the, the different pieces that can be applied in, in different uh, arrangements, uh, I'd probably, you know, want to defer to my colleague, my my colleagues of the U.S. Trade Rep Representative's Office on that. Um, I know that they've had a number of different conversations and trying to take some of the best pieces of different things uh, and trying to weave that together for, uh, you know, future collaboration. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think those conversations again are are ongoing. How can we, um, you know, how can we continue to build on on what's been done here in, in a relatively short amount of time? Melanie Bixby, State Department. Hello, Ambassador Murray. Um, I wonder if you might talk about the important role of our private sector in um, what is primarily um, trade cooperation, as well as building the inclusive economies that, that the trade seeks to promote there, as strengthening our cooperation, both in the areas of women's empowerment, but in the many other areas of inclusivity that were highlighted during the host year. No, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, as I was saying a moment ago, the, the whole public-private collaboration in APEC has been such a unique opportunity. I think probably one of the things I didn't say as much, which is really hugely important, is the role of small and medium-sized enterprises in APEC as well. I think in our economy, you look at the importance of SMEs to economic growth here at home. But when you look out across uh, the Indo-Pacific, that's really a hugely important uh, piece of a lot of those economies. And so trying to get them engaged as well uh, through APEC as a platform. Um, APEC does have the small and medium-sized enterprise ministerial uh, every year. Um, it may be one of the only organizations in the world that, that does that. And so um, we see that as a really good opportunity. And then, uh, as, as you know, in, in August, we're able to join that together with the Women in Economy Forum and able to have a joint session between SMEs and, and, and women in the economy uh, to talk about the role of women-run SMEs uh, and the challenge that they face in, in accessing supply chains uh, around the region. And so, you know, trying to use APEC as a platform to also engage all of those different voices um, from the private sector, also uh, on the inclusion side, uh, is critically important. And the U.S. has played a really positive role uh, on this uh, for the entirety of APEC's existence. We launched the Women in Economy Forum in the 2011 host year and then wanting to continue to 
make sure that there's good, you know, again, engagement between governments, the private sector, and some of these uh, groups uh, that have been historically disadvantaged or underrepresented in the region. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Akshob. Um, I was in the newsroom in 2013 in Singapore when DPP was getting galvanized and Japan was coming on board. And uh, obviously that was very vital to President Obama's pivot to Asia. And then of course, when the Trump administration came, uh, the overarching narrative was this was kind of scoring an own goal or leaving, uh, allowing you know China to kind of get an insight into um, uh, ASEAN. Um, my, my question there would be one is, would, did you see ASEAN centrality tested at that point of time, uh, given the militarization of the South China Sea happening? And two is, right now under the Biden administration, do you find that it's now clawing back on some of the lacunas left behind by withdrawing from the TPP, especially now with APEC getting a more central role? Well, I think ASEAN is hugely important to all of these things that we're talking about. I mentioned there's 12 partners in common between APEC and IPEF, for example, well, seven of those are ASEAN members. So ASEAN accounts for a third of APEC's uh, membership uh, with those seven. And so, you know, we've seen, you know, over the last couple of years, lots of uh, new opportunities to engage ASEAN as a block. Uh, there was the, uh, the ASEAN special summit uh, that was here in the United States in 2022. Um, certainly, we've very much prioritized uh, the East Asia Summit uh, opportunity uh, every fall uh, as well. And so, you know, ASEAN's role is, is hugely uh, important. And then on all the issues that we're talking about in APEC, um, you know, if it's sustainability, for example, the ASEAN members have a huge role to play uh, in a just energy transition. We have just energy transition partnerships, for example, with Indonesia and Vietnam. Uh, we want to continue to build on that. Um, ASEAN has a huge role to play when it comes to resiliency. Uh, obviously, a lot of the supply chain um, resets and um, recalibrations over the last couple of years have taken new investments into uh, ASEAN member countries. And so, you know, they, they are increasingly playing a key role, uh, including in some of those jobs of the future, like semiconductors, EV batteries, uh, some of those type things. And, you know, ASEAN also is, uh, is so important to the, the inclusivity side. Um, we don't want to be in a situation where we're only working with Singapore, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, when it came to IPEF, uh, wanting to make sure that Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, Brunei, Thailand, the Philippines, they were all, they were all there. And so I do think that, um, you know, that engagement is, is hugely important. The other point I would make here is that when we look at that Indo-Pacific strategy, economic prosperity pillar, and when we... You know, when you look at the, the, the fact sheets and things that have come out, um, you know, around the two-year anniversary a few weeks ago, you know, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that um, we, we tend to focus on a couple of things here. You know, we focus on IPEF. I certainly focus on APEC because it's what I do on a daily basis. Um, but there's a lot in there that we've been able to re-energize some of these um, relationships with the region I mentioned the Secretary Raimondo was just out there. Secretary Blinken is also, uh, you know, out there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have other bilateral and, and trilateral arrangements um, that are happening, um, you know, throughout the region. And, you know, I have, a, I have a whole list that I could go through, but there, there is a lot that's happening, uh, particularly on supply chain collaboration and other things uh, with the region um, that I think is, uh, is really important. Not to mention, of course, as well, the, the engagement with the Pacific Islands, uh, which, you know, we were very happy to see the, the funding come through for uh, the COFA agreements uh, just in the last few days. So um, there, there, is, there is a lot happening, and I think sometimes we focus on just one or two pieces of it, mm -hmm. um, but the administration's been clear that through this strategy and through the economic prosperity pillar, we want to take a multifaceted approach to the region. Yeah, and also the Wilson Center's Indo-Pacific program is very much in alignment with that. We want to take a more uh, multifaceted approach to the issues um, concerning the region. We don't want to necessarily just focus on a particular country, uh, but we want to look at institutions like APEC in ASEAN, how they impact and what uh, NATO, how they are looking at the region, what kind of partnerships there can be at the institutional as well as at the state level as well. Um, we will be launching, this is again the inaugural event of our program, but we are um, launching a year-long series about the Indo-Pacific and the world. We are also uh, 
um, launching today as a, a series of policy briefs uh, regarding um, the region as well. So I invite you to uh, not only um, come back again, but also look at our website um, for our policy briefs as well. So we are now um, slightly behind schedule, um, but I do want to thank Ambassador Murray for being um, being very generous with this time. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope we can invite you back again soon. No, thank you. It's been great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, and now we'll have Michael Kuhlman back with our panel on South and Southeast Asia. What is this? Hey, Hi, Anish. Dane. Nice to meet you. Okay, uh, let's continue our uh, program. Uh, just wanted to thank. Uh, Wanted to thank Ambassador Murray and, uh, and Chihoko for that uh, <coughs> terrific exchange on uh, APEC and U.S. economic uh, policy in the Indo-Pacific. So we're now going to shift our focus a bit uh, and direct our attention to geopolitics uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And we've convened a, a terrific group of analysts uh, on the Indo-Pacific. Be very brief in introducing them. Uh, Dane Chamorro is a partner at Control Risks and head of the Global Risk Analysis and Business Intelligence Practice in the Americas. He has over 30 years of experience working on Asia. He previously served as the Markets and Partnerships Lead for Control Risks in Asia Pacific and managing partner for the Southeast Asia business. He was also director of global risk analysis for the Asia Pacific reason, region and managing director of the company's North Asia business. Dr. Anish Gohl is a senior fellow in New America's International Security Program. Previously, he worked at the U.S. Senate Committee on Armed Services. Um, he has also worked at the Boeing Company, where he led geopolitical and aviation policy analysis. Before that, he served on the NSC as senior director for South Asia. He was also chief science and tech officer for South Asia uh, at State. Uh, Pete Larson is founder of Janus Global Advisors. He's a former foreign area officer for the U.S. Air Force, where he served in policy roles for South Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. He managed South Asia regional affairs at the NSC for two administrations. Uh, he's served as South Asia Division Chief on the Joint Staff, and he's been political military advisor to the Assistant Secretary of the Near Eastern Affairs Bureau uh, at the State Department. And last but not least, Meredith Miller has two decades of experience working on U.S.-Southeast Asia relations. She's a partner at Albright Stonebridge Group, where she leads the East Asia and Pacific practice. Uh, previously, she was senior vice president at the National Bureau of Asian Research, which I should say is a, a frequent uh, Wilson Center partner. We always enjoy our engagements with NBR. And she retains the post of senior advisor at NBR. Before that, she was in government at State's Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs and at State's Bureau of Intelligence uh, and Research. So it's a great group of, uh, of experts that we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so why don't we get right to it? And the first question will go to... Um, uh, to a niche. Uh, let's, let's talk about South Asia, which many of us like to say is the, the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific. Um, South Asia's geopolitical environment has grown increasingly complex, as, as you know. Strategic competition has heated up between uh, India and China, the U.S. and China. So what do you see um, today as the key U.S. interest in South Asia against this backdrop of intense competition? What are the inroads that uh, the, the, the U.S. is trying to make in South Asia as you see it, and what are the key risks that it faces as it pursues these interests in South Asia? All right. Thank you, Michael, and, and thanks for kicking it off with the easy one here. Um, 
Uh, I do want to thank uh, the Wilson Center for inviting me here, and uh, congratulations uh, on the launch of the Indo-Pacific program. I think that that's going to be a great program going forward, um, and I, I'm really um, uh, glad to be here. I'm, I'm actually humbled to be speaking in front of so many esteemed experts and colleagues, uh, a lot of uh, familiar faces in the audience, so thanks for having me. Um, in terms of the geopolitical environment for South Asia, I mean, uh, as, you, as you rightly described, it's growing increase, increasingly complex, right? And there's, there's more and more countries um, sort of vying for competition in this region. Uh, and what strikes me, though, is how some of these things sometimes co come full circle. Um, for many years during the Cold War, it was a competition between the U.S. and Soviet Union. Uh, and as you mentioned, now we're seeing some competition between the U.S. and Russia in this region. Uh, of course, this is not as strong as China playing a more and more increasingly um, competitive role in this region. So that's something that the United States is, um, is, is grappling with as well. And so you can see that, you know, perhaps more than any time in the past 50 years, um, South Asia is becoming sort of an important region for, for lots of different global actors, um, not just India or not just the United States. Um, and so when we talk about the key U.S. interests in South Asia against this backdrop of intense competition, uh, I think the interests are the same that we've seen uh, for decades now, but sort of evolving in the character uh, of those interests. And those interests, of course, are security and stability. Um, and how it's been evolving is that, you know, it, it used to focus intensely on preventing nuclear war in the region, uh, I think, as everyone is familiar. And then it shifted to preventing terrorism uh, and preventing not only cross-border terrorism in the region, but terrorism being exported uh, to Western countries and particularly to the United States. Uh, and then it shifted back to nuclear war. Uh, and then it shifted back to terrorism. And now it's shifted again to preventing war, but it's more of, of preventing war between China and India. Um, than it is between India and Pakistan. I think the sort of the threat of war between India and Pakistan has receded into the background a little bit, and people are intensely focused on in the India-China competition. Um, and so what the U.S. is trying to do, right, uh, is trying to manage this competition. Um, and, and I don't want to say that this is the end-all, be-all of U.S. interests in the region. Even if China wasn't there, the United States has significant security interests in the region. You know, a partnership with India is a critical um, strategic priority for the United States, as it has been for 20 years, irrespective of what China is doing in the region. And so the United States, at the same time, is trying to ensure security and stability, is trying to, is trying to build partnerships in the region. Um, the partnership with India is going pretty well so far, but maybe with some other countries in the region, um, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and so what we see is that the United States um, is seeing this competition with China, is seeing this competition with Russia, and it, it's trying to counter all of that. Um, the relationship with India, although it's going well, you can see that the, the competition with Russia is ramping up, particularly within the last couple of years. Um, both, country, both China and India are trying to cultivate ties with Moscow, and this has really scrambled the geopolitics in South Asia uh, because it creates this sort of triangle of sort of competition, and then you have the United States sort of layering in as well on top of that. And so, and so managing the security, managing the stability, and increasing partnerships. When we talk about key risks that the United States is facing in this region, it comes down to two main things. Uh, one is that, you know, don't forget about the smaller countries. Uh, everyone focuses on India and Pakistan and, you know, China in this region, but Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, even the Maldives are becoming increasingly uh, competitive battlegrounds uh, in this region. And just as we saw China making huge inroads in Pacific Ocean Island countries, uh, they're doing the same thing in the Indian Ocean. Um, and it was only a sort of in response to that the United States sort of started building its own relationships in Pacific Ocean Islands. Um, and I, I don't, I'm sure you all recall seeing, you know, the Secretary of State rush out to the Solomon Islands when, it, when they signed a defense uh, cooperation agreement with China. Uh, and the same sort of thing is probably going to be happening in the Indian Ocean uh, moving forward. Uh, same thing with Nepal, right? Sandwiched between India and China, it is a battleground for intense competition as well. So I would advise the United States not to neglect the smaller countries in the region. The other key risk that the United States faces is the erosion of democracy in the region. Um, I think we've all seen how a number of states in South Asia are turning more and more authoritarian and sort of taking off the guardrails that um, sort of prop up democracy. 
I never thought we'd come to see the day where we could arguably say that the most free and fair elections in the region are being held in Pakistan. Um, but that seems to be the case right now. And for the longest time, you know, the United States was making the case that, you know, these are, uh, these are democracies, we need to support them. But we're seeing the erosion of democracy in India, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in the Maldives, um, and to a certain extent in Nepal as well. And this is a huge security risk for the United States because as, as much as these countries turn towards authoritarianism, they're gonna be more enthralled to um, Chinese overtures. Uh, in terms of this competition. And so um, the United States um, really needs to manage all that going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. Really, really interesting. Um, let's, let's move east now and shift to the, the geopolitics of uh, Southeast Asia. So Meredith, uh, come to you now. Um, you know, as we all know, the geopolitics of South Asia are just as complex as those of South Asia. You've got non-aligned states, you've got middle powers, and unlike in South Asia, South Asia, there are U.S. treaty allies as well. Um, so against this backdrop, I'll pose a very similar question to you that I posed to Anish. What do you see as the key um, U.S. strategic interest in South Asia, Southeast Asia? What inroads is the U.S. trying to make there, and what are the key risks it faces as it pursues these interests? Great. Um, thanks so much, Michael, and, and thank you to you and the Woodrow Wilson Center for including me in the conversation. Um, before I embark on answering that um, broad and very important strategic question, I just wanted to start with a couple points of context about Southeast Asia, um, keying off uh, something uh, Michael said in his framing. So one, it is a very complex region, and I think it's important to acknowledge in any conversation about Southeast Asia how diverse of a region it is. So that diversity is in terms of economic development, political systems, um, but importantly for the conversation that we're having here today um, in relationships with the US and China and other regional powers. Um, that said, um, Southeast Asian countries also share some um, very uh, structural and similar um, conditions in their geostrategic outlook, one being the location uh, between China and India, um, as well as, um, particularly in, in recent years, a real uh, favoring towards leveraging multilateral forums to engage with great powers and to advance uh, country level and regional interests. Um, so I think it's also fair to say that's a region that um, has a long history and a fair amount of sophistication in managing great power uh, rivalries uh, to varying degrees of success. Um, and that's important to keep in mind in thinking about U.S. interests and how we pursue our interests in the region. Um, so turning to that, that broad question, I think you'll hear very similar themes to those um, that we heard from Anish in thinking about um, what are U.S. strategic interests in Southeast Asia. Of course, we have very deep economic interests in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, collectively, the 10 uh, current members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations are the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, it's the second most important export market for the United States. And importantly, in thinking about our future interests, it's also a region with a tremendous amount of potential for growth and additional development. Um, some of the economies in the region are projected to grow at over 6% over the next five years. Um, it is at the forefront of technological adaptation, the location of important natural resources and critical minerals, um, and in many of the key economies in the, in the region, um, younger populations as well. So this is economically, very strategically important region for the United States um, to remain engaged with and to remain competitive. On the security front, um, the U.S. has had a long and abiding commitment to peace and stability in Southeast Asia, um, and particularly uh, in uh, recent uh, years, a lot of attention and focus on, as well, our commitment to freedom of navigation um, and to peaceful resolution of territorial uh, disputes in the maritime domain, uh, some of them between uh, Southeast Asian states uh, but very significantly for this conversation, um, some between Southeast Asian states and China, uh, given China's uh, expansive maritime uh, claims through the nine dash, nine dash line, which encompasses much of the South China Sea. And the third bucket I would mention in terms of U.S. interests is what I would sort of characterize as our global interests. Um, the United States needs active engagement and partnership from Southeast Asia 
to solve many of the challenges that we're pursuing um, successful resolution of at a global, a global level. So this includes um, climate change mitigation and adaptation, <coughs> uh, realization of the sustainable development goals. Um, it also includes um, reforming, adapting, and updating international institutions so that they remain uh, relevant and functioning into the future. And I, I mentioned earlier the economic diversity of Southeast Asia, some of the richest countries in the world are located there. Um, but importantly, uh, many Southeast Asian countries are also targeting um, their achievement of developed countries' status um, within the next 15 years, which will make them even more important uh, players uh, for the United States and for others on the international stage. And in the context of great power rivalry, uh, Southeast Asian countries and ASEAN also have an important role to play as conveners and coalition builders around some of these global challenges. And um, this was on um, full display uh, when Indonesia hosted the G20 in 2022. Um, Ambassador Murray was talking about how uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine impacted uh, the U.S. and APEC. It also had a huge reverberating impact on the G20. And at, in the early part of the year, uh, many were questioning the viability of that platform as a forum for the world's uh, leading global economies to come together uh, and discuss issues of global importance. Um, Indonesia really uh, put a lot of effort into keeping everyone at the table uh, and was joined in that by other middle powers. And we see uh, the G20 continuing to progress um, as a challenged um, but still functioning forum uh, for these kinds of discussions. Um, for the United States approach, uh, the Biden administration has pursued a mix of multilateralism, I think in response to that real desire uh, from Southeast Asian countries to engage collectively um, and has uh, increased its engagement with, with ASEAN and elevated the U.S. relationship with ASEAN. On the bilateral front, I think the picture is more mixed. We've seen some great progress in strengthening U.S. relations um, with the two countries who are really at the forefront of uh, the territorial dispute with China that I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Vietnam and the Philippines. Uh, President Marcos will be uh, coming to Washington uh, in April and joining Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden in, in a trilateral discussion, um, as well as a, a bilateral meeting at the White House, um, which is another example of how the Biden administration has pursued objectives in the region, which is through uh, mini-lateralism and bringing in select partners and allies to um, subsets of uh, friendly or partner nation discussions around issues of uh, common interest in the region. Um, in terms of risks to U.S. policy um, and U.S. interests in the region, I'm going to frame this more in terms of our approach than Ashish's broader framing about the region overall. But one, um, I think, you know, Matt talked in the earlier panel about the U.S. hosting of APEC. I think that was a really important initiative that the Biden administration invested a lot in on the <laughs> sort of economic <coughs> engagement front. He mentioned IPF. Um, but overall, I think there's a, a strong sense in the region um, that the U.S. Uh, lacks a comprehensive economic and trade engagement strategy, which is really fundamental to uh, what Southeast Asian countries are looking for from the United States and how they've traditionally approached uh, multilateral and bilateral engagement with great powers. Um, so that's a real weakness, and it's a, it's a risk over the medium and longer term for U.S. companies that want to be a part of this uh, vibrant economy and are facing an increasingly competitive environment. Um, another risk, I would say, for U.S. foreign policy is taking too narrow of a lens and looking at Southeast Asia as a region uh, solely through the prism of our geostrategic competition with China. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our interests in Southeast Asia are deep. Um, and at multiple levels, both bilaterally within the region and then on a global scale as well. And to frame that too narrowly um, is a real missed opportunity. 
And it also opens up the door to another risk I would mention, which would be that if there is a, a further hardening of uh, U.S.-China um, relations and less movement for Southeast Asian countries to manage their engagement with both powers, and by that I mean more pressure from either the U.S. or China to choose sides, um, that would also be a risk, I would say, to our overall uh, interests in the region. And I will stop there, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, so now let's let's zoom out a bit more geographically and, and focus on the the Indian Ocean region, uh, the IOR, which is essentially that vast uh, space. It stretches from uh, from east the east coast of Africa to the west coast of Australia. Um, so Pete, this is the, you have been doing a lot of thinking about this uh, and particularly about the strategic significance of the IOR. So can you tell us about the importance of the IOR in the context of Indo-Pacific security? Uh, why does the IOR matter for Washington? What are the challenges for U.S. policy in the IOR, and how can they be addressed to help achieve U.S. interests? No, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks, Michael, for having me today, and congratulations on uh, this initiative. It's a good one. Um, so here in the, the comments of my colleagues, I, I, I agree with them. Um, and really, uh, I'll say starting out that the IOR is linked uh, to the to the Indo-Pacific in, in uh, very real ways. Um, Alfred Mahan, who was the influential American naval strategist, once said of the IOR to the, to the ocean, whoever controls the Indian Ocean dominates Asia. This ocean is key to the seven seas in the 21st century. The destiny of the world will be decided in these waters. I would say that Mahan's uh, words were kind of prophetic in, in, uh, in how we should look at it, uh, but it's very difficult for us as a, as a U.S. to look at this ocean, and, and I'll tell you a few reasons why I think so. Um, first of all, it is important. IOR is home to a third of the world's uh, population, and uh, as we know, it has uh, some of the, uh, the most important uh, maritime uh, choke points in the world. Um, you know, where, whether you're talking about Hormuz or Malacca coming into it or, or the Bab el-Mandeb or uh, the Mozambique Channel, um, you're talking some serious, serious sea lines of communication that feed uh, the world and uh, feed China in particular. Eighty percent of uh, um, China's uh, oil goes through these channels. So this is very strategic to China, um, it's, and it's also strategic to India. Uh, China is investing hundreds of millions of dollars through their Belt and Road Initiative into the littoral uh, countries of the Indian Ocean and the islands. Uh, they're financing all kinds of projects through, through uh, state-owned enterprises. Um, they have, uh, they're part of 21 different ports in some way in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so we're talking some serious hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure that's being built by China as they're looking forward to their own vulnerabilities in the region. India is doing the same, and it's kind of sensational. I'm sure you've heard the, uh, you know, the string of pearls and, and then the counter with India is the, the diamond necklace of port infrastructure throughout, the, uh, throughout these regions. And we don't need to use those terms, but I can tell you that the, the investments that uh, both countries are expending into this area is, is, is extensive, and it's growing. Um, the IOR is absolutely paramount to, the, to India, and it's not just the way we look at the Indo-Pacific, where we, we kind of stop from at India. They keep looking west. And they, we talk about India being a net security partner uh, provider for, for, the, for the ocean. Just last week, I don't know if you caught on the news, that uh, India uh, led a, a pretty harrowing and successful military operation um, in, uh, t uh, with some Somali pirates. And, and it, was a it was a Bulgarian flagship, and it was joint. It, it was C-17s, it was the naval destroyer, um, it's the type of operation the U.S. would conduct. So they are uh, looking west, very much so. Um, now, the challenge. 
and why it's tough for us as a what I think is as a as a, as a U.S. to to have a strategy um, of coherence or a policy um, that protects our interest in this region. In the Indo-Pacific, you have one COCOM, the Indo-Pacific Command, uh, that kind of looks after it. And, and really, when you get into the State Department bureaus and the NSC, it's, it's very similar. The Indian Ocean is, uh, well, is completely different. I mean, you're, you're talking about four COCOMs uh, from, from the U.S. military. Uh, that there's seams in between each one of those. Uh, as we said, Indo-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific Command stops at India. Um, so what happens past that? Well, you're going into CENTCOM, you're going into AFRICOM. And this makes an extremely, I can tell you from experience, extremely challenging when you're trying to pull it all together into to, uh, a look that's kind of coherent. Um, it's the same thing with the state bureaus. There's four state bureaus looking at this area. When I was on NSC, there's four for NSC directorates, it's very difficult. And I'm not saying that there aren't kind of global looks uh, within the Pentagon or, or elsewhere that, that try to pull it all together, but trying to get the bandwidth on the Indian Ocean is, is extremely difficult. And in my opinion, it creates a strategic gap. So I'll leave it there and um, turn it back over to you, Michael. Well, thank you, uh, Pete. So. Dane, let's come to you now. Uh, you, you look at risk uh, in the Indo-Pacific from a, from a business perspective. Um, what, what do you see as some of the key commercial trends playing out in the Indo-Pacific, particularly in terms of great power uh, economic activity and competition? And what do you see as uh, key, risks, key risks that companies face in navigating these complexities and volatilities? Yeah, thanks, Michael, and thanks for having me. Um, and I should... I should uh, make a little bit of a caveat here. I'm not an analyst. We have our lead global analyst sitting right there. His name is John Wood, and he's fantastic. So I'm a little bit of a, uh, an imposter up here today. But um, I think three trends kind of leap out at me. One is um, we've seen a lot of clients attempting to de-risk their supply chains, their investment from China, which is different than leaving China. They're not leaving China, but they want to diversify, uh, which is logical, um, to particularly to Southeast Asia, but not only to Southeast Asia. So Vietnam has been a big winner, as we all know. Also Thailand, um, but also places like Poland and Mexico and Hungary and Turkey. There's a lot of countries that have benefited from it. And one of the challenges that they face is, um, I, we hear this word a lot, you know, we're going to de-risk by, by shifting some of our production, some of our supply chain from China to somewhere else. And I say, well, actually, you're not de-risking, you're re-risking, right? You're, you're, you might be lowering your geopolitical risk from a U.S.-China perspective, but you go to some of these other jurisdictions and you have much higher, for example, corruption risk as a, as a foreign player, as a foreign investor, as a foreign company. You have much higher corruption risk. You have much higher security risk in some places like Mexico. Um, and you have higher risk from infrastructure not working or labor challenges or whatever it might be. So I think that's the first point that we typically make is you're changing your risk basket. You're probably not just going to one place. If you're trying to diversify from China, you're probably going to several. And that gets complicated. It gets costly and it gets complicated, particularly if you don't have experience working in some of those jurisdictions. The second thing we've seen is, of course, a huge wave of Chinese investment, which is continuing and going to continue to continue in Southeast Asia particularly, whether it's automotive, whether it's electronics, whether it's digital um, critical minerals that Ambassador Blake mentioned earlier, and particularly the Indonesian uh, nickel space, um, I don't see that slowing down. And it really, in many ways, swamps a lot of the other uh, investment from wherever it might be coming to into the ASEAN region. Um, you just look at what BYD and some of the other Chinese um, automobile, new, new vehicle manufacturers have talked about with respect to Thailand. Um, somebody called it the Detroit of, of Southeast Asia, I think, earlier, which is true. Um, and it's just, it's, it's very difficult to compete with. There's a lot of resources behind it, a lot of money behind it. And some of that is um, incentivized by the Chinese government. A lot of it is, and I think we here particularly tend to look at this as a Chinese state-driven initiative, and there are certain elements of that, but I don't think we should ever lose sight of the fact that Chinese private companies, particularly, whether it's Huawei or BYD or a few others, are led by very aggressive, very capable entrepreneurs. 
um, who've been doing this for a long time. This is not new. So uh, the Huawei issue, you know, was was quite an issue several years ago here and globally uh, around 5G. And people really overlooked the fact that Huawei had been in Africa for 20 years doing 2G and 3G and 4G and going to countries that nobody else wanted to go to, no other commercial entity wanted to go to, to provide them turnkey uh, mobile networks, right? So don't ever underestimate a, a Chinese entrepreneur. I think that's the, the second piece. Um, the third thing that we see is, and obviously that's providing competition for, for U.S. companies in all these regions, the third thing I think we see is str- companies really struggling with um, – the predictability of some of these jurisdictions from either a political perspective, a policy perspective, um, and, and, other, and others that you know, business likes predictability. They like consistency. Um, and they struggle when they get to some of these environments where these systems are not familiar. Um, Vietnam is a, is a great example. Adam Schwartz is sitting here. He has a lot of, lot of experience in Vietnam. Um, it's it's Game of Thrones type politics, right? Really complicated. And Southeast Asia particularly, I would say, Thailand was mentioned earlier in the earlier panel, Malaysia. Um, the politics are really complicated, right? And businesses, business doesn't follow politics for the sake of following it. They follow it because it can impact them, right? Either because the policies change or may change or they may be disadvantaged and a local player or another player from another country might be advantaged by that policy or decision-making stops. And that's what's happened to a certain degree in Vietnam as they go through their wave after wave of kind of corruption slash political um, gaming within the party, within the Communist Party in Vietnam. People get fearful of making decisions. Bureaucrats stop making decisions because they're fearful of how that might be used against them when the pieces on the chessboard change and you have a new Politburo, a new central committee, a new leader, et cetera, et cetera. And we find that businesses have a really, you know, really struggle with that, which is not not surprising because that's not what they do. And so a lot of what we do is help them with that piece, which is seeing behind, okay, the scenarios around if if this person is the next leader, the next prime minister, the next Bhupati, the next chief minister, whatever it is, how could that affect your investment, your operation, uh, your competition, your the regulation that you have to comply with, and provide them that kind of analysis on a on a regular basis? So I think those are the things that we see them, you know, that we see businesses uh, challenged by. Thank you for that. Um, so before we open things up uh, to the audience, I just wanted to revisit uh, a few themes that we've touched on earlier uh, in our event uh, this morning. Uh, I'd be curious to, to get the, the views of the panel. One is on the issue of tech, which, you know, critical and emerging technologies, uh, this is something that is unavoidable in any serious conversation about the Indo-Pacific, but I wanted to ask a question about the geopolitics of, uh, of tech. Um, and this is for anyone that would like to respond. How are critical and emerging technologies affecting the geopolitics political environment? How are they shaping relations between the countries of the Indo-Pacific, and what might this entail for, uh, for U.S. strategic interests? You want to take a crack at that? Yeah, please. I, I'd like to just start off. Uh, I, I recently uh, saw that uh, the SEA Bureau within state uh, w- went over to, I think it was uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, held what I thought was a really, really important conference, or was part of one, on cybersecurity. Um, and it really did pull in uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of interest in the region, and it's these types of things that I think are going to keep growing. And uh, with we have the DTA initiative going over to the Africa side, which is picking up a lot of steam, and they're doing wonderful things there. So I think it's just how well, going back to how do we connect this all of our initiatives. That's the difficult thing for me, as I see it is uh, you have these initiatives being done led by the different artificial bureaucratic groupings, how we divided up uh, the, the Indian Ocean region. How do we pull that together is the question. Hmm. Anyone else? Want to... well, yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, take a quick shot at this, Michael. Um, you know, putting aside all the benefits uh, of emerging technology in terms of lifting people out of poverty and improving communications. I think in South Asia, in terms of geopolitics, you know, these new and advanced technologies are sowing mistrust um, and suspicion uh, because there's 
you know, any time a new app comes out or there's a, there's a sort of new advance in technology, there's always a worry that the information is going to get, you know, passed on to a different country. Um, you know, we, we argue here in the U.S. of whether or not we want to ban TikTok. Uh, India already did that uh, a couple of years ago um, because they were worried about the exact same thing that the United States is worried about. And so it, it sort of intensifies a sort of competition um, and it creates new avenues uh, for militaries to attack each other. Um, as Pete was saying, you know, cyber is a significant area uh, of geopolitical uh, competition right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think right now, um, there's not a lot of policy um, frameworks in place to govern this technology at the geopolitical level. And so it's sort of sowing mistrust among different countries. Hmm. Thank you. What else? Okay. Why don't we take a pause? I want to make sure we have time, a good amount of time for questions. I could always come back to some of my own. Um, so if we have questions here in the audience, and also as you've been reminded, those of you tuning in online, uh, if you have a question, just put, write it into the chat box. It'll come over to us. But uh, first, do we have any initial questions here in the room? Uh, okay, let's start with you, sir. Yes, uh, David Gossick. I'm a consultant here and lived in the region for many years. Um, my question is, with the increase of economic focus in Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, over the past few years, an increase of, uh, of de-risking uh, investment moving out of China and into Southeast Asia and elsewhere in the region. What is your assessment of the impact of that, that growth of, of FDI into the region out of China, and, but including Chinese investment coming into the region as well? Uh, impact on uh, transparent business transparent transparency governance and corruption environment uh, in Southeast Asia and maybe in India as well. Thank you. Directed to anyone in particular or whoever. Anyone want to cut a stab at that? No, I'll take Dane, it. I'll yeah, take it seems like your kind yeah. of question. So actually, that was raised. Thanks, David, for the question. It was raised, um, I think, by Ambassador Blake in one of the earlier panels. He was specifically re referring to B BRI contracts, right? And one of the huge problems with BRI contracts is they're typically no bid, right? <laughs> so uh, that's a huge issue. Um, I think it's 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 certainly an issue too with private investment from China to some of these countries. Remember also that this is a uh, corruption is a is a dance of two partners, right? It's it's not just the giver; it's also the receipt the recipient. Um, and I think the you know you've seen places like Indonesia, for example, where they've scaled back a lot on their anti-corruption enforcement. Um, and as I said before, all of these markets provide really challenging environments, particularly for U.S. companies who are governed by the FCPA. Um, and I don't – overall, I would say that, you know, investment from – not just from China, but from other countries in Asia into this region often doesn't help the transparency game uh, or the, the efforts that whatever countries might have uh, with respect to anti-corruption anti and anti-corrupt behavior. And we know in some places it's also a – becomes a political issue locally, right? That's happened in South Asia and in the Indian Ocean region. In, with certain countries, it's happened in Malaysia in a big way. Uh, where it actually becomes a political issue, right, that people campaign on. Probably the 1MDB is probably one of the best examples of, of that and also tied in some ways to BRI, right? Um, so, but having said that, I think the, when you look at the investments that are coming in, in almost any space, right, um, overall, it's, it's net positive for these countries, right? And when we, we serve clients from all nationalities. We have big Chinese clients, we have big Japanese clients, big Korean clients, big U.S. clients, European clients, et cetera. Um, you know, a lot of them are big, sophisticated companies. They've been dealing in difficult environments for a long time. One of the, one of the challenges we see in places actually pretty much across Southeast Asia and Mexico is um, availability of skilled labor, right? Um, so we have, you know, Japan has been an investor in, in Thailand for decades and decades, right? Um, they love it as a place to do business, as do most MNCs. And when you ask them, what's your biggest challenge in Thailand? It's, I can't get Thai engineers, right? They're not making anymore. Um, and I can't bring a Japanese engineer here because that 
totally throws my business model off. I need to use a local engineer, and I can't get any more, right? I can get unskilled labor, but I don't need that. I need skilled labor. And as the uh, investment flows become more sophisticated, <clears throat> these, these countries are going to have a real – they already have a real challenge with providing skilled labor, whether it's Indonesia, which is huge and right demographic, but quite often falls short on the skilled labor side – or Vietnam, where you're actually missing a generation of people because of the war, and also short on and, you know, educate, this folds back in the education system and everything else, right? So that's one of the biggest challenges that, that we see a lot of our companies facing is, or our clients facing, is that they, the, you know, some of these problems they're used to dealing with, a lot of corruption, <clears throat> but the, the skilled labor thing is, is a multi-year problem. You don't serve, so, solve that overnight. You need to start solving it now for a generation from now, right? So that's one of the, one of the things, I think. Can I jump in yeah, on that too, Michael? Good. So th thank you for the question. Maybe just to supplement um, what Dane just said, I think there's also a bit of a positive competition happening among many of the countries in the region to secure more FDI, um, particularly um, setting aside the China piece, which Dane answered quite well, from U.S., European, Japanese companies. So it's not uncommon, I think, especially to hear Indonesian policymakers uh, ruminate on why is Vietnam getting so much more of this investment than we are, um, and leading that into a conversation about how to improve overall uh, business conditions in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the overall business regulatory environment. So I think there's a, there's a positive impact in that sense as well. How different countries in the region are pursuing that varies quite a bit from Indonesia to Vietnam to Thailand to Malaysia. Uh, to name a few, um, but I think overall a huge net positive for Southeast Asia and one that the region is continuing to think about how to best capture. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to give people who haven't asked the question previously a chance first. So yes, see you, sir. Thanks. Um, <coughs> uh, thanks. <coughs> sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is. Uh, Adam Schwartz, the CEO of Asia Group Advisors, and hello, everybody on the panel. Uh, thank you for your remarks. I had two questions, um, one for Anish, one for Meredith, but it's sort of, again, anybody could uh, answer them. Anish, you made a, a comment in your remarks about, um, the, I guess, the connection between what you saw as democratic regression and a more pro-China tilt in, a, in the foreign policy arena. Be interested to hear you say more about that, maybe with some examples and, and kind of why, why you think that connection holds. Um, and, and Meredith, you, you made the point that a number of countries in the region are, uh, rightly so, kind of grappling with how to manage rising China-U.S. Uh, competition. Um, and they're all kind of doing it in slightly different ways. Um, uh, curious whether you see any prospect of the region acting as a region on this issue, whether at, a, at an ASEAN level or a mini ASEAN level, um, and whether the kind of the fairly recent arrival of new leaders in Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, and about to have a new leader in Indonesia, whether this new crop of leaders is more inclined to operate that way than, uh, than the people they replaced. Thank you. Anish, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, a connection um, that, that's important to keep in mind for the United States. The, the big exception to this holding is India, right? And there, I don't foresee any situation or any scenario where India sort of becomes an ally of China or tilts towards China just because of the, the strategic competition that exists there. But for a lot of the smaller countries in South Asia, um, we're seeing that the erosion of democracy leads them to be more susceptible to uh, cooperating with China. Maldives is a great example, I think, uh, of this right now. Um, they just had an election earlier this year where they elected someone with a very pro-China tilt, and immediately upon entering office, um, he signed a, a military cooperation agreement with the Chinese. Um, and what the Chinese bring um, is that, you know, they bring sort of a, not only military cooperation and military assistance, but they also bring economic investment with no strings attached, right? With, with the Chinese, you don't get lectured about human rights. You don't get lectured about democracy or holding elections or anything like that. And for someone who already has an authoritarian bent, that's very attractive. Because um, when you talk to the United States, the United States says, well, we'll give you some assistance, but you know, you got to do this for us, you got to do that. You know, you got to show your commitment to human rights and you know, you got to let out all political prisoners and things like that. None of that occurs with China. And so for some people, that's very attractive. Um, and, and we're seeing this in Nepal that's happening. Um, they're starting to tilt towards China as well because they've now got a communist government uh, sort of in office. Um, and so we have the very real possibility of 
a significant number of smaller South Asian countries uh, being more sympathetic to China than they are to either India or the United States. Hmm. Right. Yeah, thanks for the great question, Adam. I think I'm going to flip the order you asked it in um, in my answer. So. Um, first off, uh, will we see stronger voices and more engagement from some of the key countries in Southeast Asia that have recently gone through elections, I think is a really interesting and important uh, question. And I think Dane was talking about this earlier. We've seen, um, as a result of political weakness in Malaysia and Thailand, um, a more inward-looking focus. Um, Indonesia just went through a massive election cycle and is in the middle of a, a presidential transition. Um, and with Marcos, we saw a real change in policy from the Duterte administration in terms of the appetite um, and enthusiasm for engaging more closely with the United States. Um, I'm optimistic on, the, on this. I think that um, if you look at the configuration of um, new leaders in that context, uh, Prabowo Subianto, the president-elect in Indonesia, is very comfortable in the international domain. Um, he's uh, been serving as Minister of Defense, uh, but speaks six languages, um, has very close relationships um, with a number of countries, and I think will be very active and vocal in pursuing um, Indonesia's interests internationally and continuing the trajectory that we've seen during the Jokowi administration of Indonesia really uh, wanting to assume more of a role on the international stage commensurate with how um, Indonesians see the size and, and what should be the influence of the country. Um, in Thailand, uh, in the last panel, there was a bit of discussion, I think, about the opening for closer engagement with the United States in particular following the election, um, though uh, not a perfect result. And I think um, when we think about the Philippines, the, the answer to that is very clear. So I, I do think we'll see a bit more activist uh, foreign policy on the whole across Southeast Asia. Um, to your second question, uh, will that lead to more collective ASEAN uh, engagement? I am less certain. I think historically uh, ASEAN has only come together very strongly to weigh in with great powers in times of an extreme uh, geopolitical test. Um, so in the absence of that, I think we'll probably continue to see the organization try to position itself as a forum for convening, um, for engaging with great powers, but unlikely to weigh in in any meaningful way in how the US and China are, are going to be approaching each other in terms of their bilateral policy. Hmm. Thank you. Let's take some more questions. Maybe we could combine them. Uh, I know there were some more hands up. Yeah, you had had your hand up earlier. Yes, we'll take your question first. This is a question for Meredith and Dane. And <clears throat> Meredith, you sort of noted that they, there's some disappointment in the lack of a, the trade and financial um, progress um, being made by the U.S. government. And clearly this is something that disadvantages U.S. companies. So looking domestically, do you see any actions by U.S. companies to push the government on this? Um, and if so, do you see any areas where you are at all optimistic that, that there might be a shift or an improvement or, let's say, some, some beef? Thank you, and let's uh, come back here. Uh, yeah, right here. Oh, thank you. My question is uh, to Anish Joel. Uh, you mentioned, you rightly mentioned about uh, that uh, the South Asia is very contentious and geopolitics is also very complex. So uh, it is probably one of the few regions in the whole in the Pacific where all the, the prime actors of the current days uh, great power competitions, uh, Russia, China, India, and the US are at play and probably they have uh, more or less similar influence. So my question is, what do you think would be the U.S. foreign policy in that region going forward? Do you think the U.S. would remain offshore and delegate more power to the India to manage the small and medium power countries in that region? Or do you think that U.S. would directly engage with the each and every countries in that region? Thank you. Thanks, and I think there was a hand over here on this side. Was there? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, closely related. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Anish Goyal, 
what made the, ch the shift in India to engage more with the United States versus the traditional relationship with Russia? Let's take things back to the panel. Manish, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Those questions directed to you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with your question about um, what will be the un United States policy uh, going into the region. And I, I actually think it's a, a hybrid of what you described. It's going to be partnership with India. Uh, and sort of trying to manage the region. There, there is no way that India will let the United States become the most dominant player in the region. Um, they view South Asia as their backyard, rightly, and uh, they want to be the ones calling the shots there. At the same time, um, India is, I, I think, you know, I don't want to speak for the Indian government or the U.S. government, but um, uh, I think India is coming to the realization that the United States can be a stabilizing force um, and that they can that that they have shared interests right now, um, and it's it's important to take advantage of that um, that um, confluence uh, of interests right now. So I so I think it's going to be partnerships. Um, there are, there are a number of examples where the United States tried to come in to some maybe some of the smaller countries and do something on their own, and India was the one that stopped it because they don't they don't want uh, the United States having independent relationships with them. Um, so it's going to be partnerships going forward. Um, in terms of why India is, uh, you know, maybe um, uh, having a shift and becoming closer to the United States, I, I think it all has to do with China. Um, as the India-China competition has flared over the recent years, it has pushed India closer to the United States. India sees the benefit of being sort of a major strategic partner of the United States um, in keeping sort of uh, Chinese ambitions at bay. Um, and the United States has not been shy about courting India in this regard. Um, if you listen to a lot of American officials these days, it, it's all about supporting India as a counterweight to China, right? I, I don't necessarily agree with all of that, but but it's definitely part of the mix. And uh, what 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 India fears um, is invasion by China, or at least uh, you know a, a chunk of their territory being taken. Um, and they feel, and they feel like um, the United States can be a um, mitigating uh, partner in this regard. And so, uh, I think you know we've we've really seen with 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 the United States becoming more aggressive towards China, it's given window for India to become more aggressive towards China, and it's driven the two together. Did you want to go ahead? Yeah, I maybe mean, I'll come back to um, Piper's important question about the prospects for enhanced um, U.S. trade leadership uh, in the region and what role the private sector is playing in those conversations. Um, in conversations um, with the private sector and trade associations in the region, there's continued tremendous appetite, as I mentioned earlier, for more U.S. leadership and engagement um, to join the TPP. Uh, and companies continue to raise this with the U.S. government um, and to participate actively in the forums that are provided for engagement. So Ambassador Murray uh, was talking about the U.S. hosting of APEC. There was very strong U.S. Uh, private sector participation in those meetings. Um, the U.S. private sector has participated in the IPEF dialogues to the maximum extent possible, um, despite those being non-binding agreements, which I think really demonstrates that um, there is a, a hope that that will seed something that's more binding and has more market access provisions in the future. Um, as we are in election cycle in the US, I think there's also a pretty widespread acknowledgement and awareness of the political climate in, in this country and the political realities of how far uh, the US might be able to go in pursuing um, a more robust trade agenda in the region. Uh, if there is a second Biden administration, um, I think it's possible we might see a little bit more movement, but I, I wouldn't go so far as to say I think the U.S. would rejoin uh, TPP, unfortunately, uh, any time in the near future. And if there's a Trump administration, I think there's been pretty clear statements from former President Trump about um, how he would uh, pursue more protectionist policies um, than we currently have in place. So I, I think overall, and I was thinking about this in the risk context of the question you asked earlier, Michael, we, we do have a brand problem as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there is an understanding among those in the region who follow U.S. politics closely that we are in a period of uh, more of an inward uh, focus, an America first focus, and whatever the result of the election uh, in November, um, they'll be dealing with the United States that still has a high degree of polarization and a high degree 
of um, uh, apprehension about engaging more robustly in that uh, context for the near future. Well, thank you. Um, as we begin to wrap up, what I wanted to do is just invite each of our uh, speakers to offer a, you know, a 30 second, 60 second uh, concluding comment. What would you like to most leave us uh, with uh, here? And um, perhaps you'd like to speak about what you see as the single most pressing geopolitical risk that the U.S. faces in the region. That's just a suggestion. But if you could just uh, quickly leave us with what you'd like to, uh, to leave us with. And why don't we go in reverse order from the start? So, Dane, why don't we start with you? Thanks. So I think um, I'd probably echo a, a lot of what Ambassador Blake said in the first um, the first panel about uh, trade access, about infrastructure, about soft power, where we really bat under our weight. Um, and a lot of that is due to resources, and a lot of the resource problem is due to our own domestic politics. So I think if there were a few things we could do to, to turn around the brand problem, as I, I like that phrase, uh, it would be those things, right? So these countries and these business communities want access to our market. It's pretty simple. Um, China gives them that. So if we're talking about just a competition with China, that's one thing that we can do very easily. We can't, it'd be hard for us, I think, to comp compete with BRI, but trade access is actually something that's politically very difficult. But economically, from a resource perspective, it's relatively easy. The soft power thing is really important, and I think we underestimate how much um, how much value that can have. I remember Gita Wiriwan, who's a former minister in Indonesia, you know, came to the United States on a scholarship, right? Um, and there are many, many examples of that. We should do a lot more of that. I think the thing that business could do better in this, these, this region that we're talking about, but generally speaking globally, is uh, have a slightly longer-term view. So when I think about um, you know, think about a country head, a uh, regional head of a U.S. multinational versus, let's say, maybe their Japanese or Chinese counterpart. Usually their Japanese or Chinese counterpart are there for many years, right? They learn the language. They make connections. These are high-touch societies, high-touch cultures. Uh, you need to be at the weddings and the birthdays and go to the festivals and all those things. And if you're only there for two or three years and then you go to your next assignment, and this is just true for, for government, by the way, um, you don't get that stickiness. And the, generally speaking, Chinese, Japanese, other Asian um, business, business cultures, they send people for an extended period of time. And then you develop the relationships and you play golf with the, the next minister and all of those things. And that's really important. So that's the comment I would say for the business community. Thank you. Uh, Pete. Sure. Um, so... I would say that uh, with the Indian Ocean specifically, uh, we probably need to start paying a little more attention here in the United States. Um, China is certainly paying attention to the Indian Ocean. Uh, all you got to do is look at CPEC and that $80 billion pro project that, that goes from the mainland down to the Indian Ocean or what or their uh, Chu Piao port in Myanmar or you name it. It's going across all the way. Um, to Africa. So we have to start paying attention to this, and it's extremely difficult to do because of our uh, bureaucracy, but we can do it. Um, and I would just say that, uh, you know, maybe at some forums where we start pulling uh, our, our, the different silos together. Uh, I've seen this done for Africa specifically because that's kind of siloed off from the north to the south, and we do that from time to time. And uh, I think we're going to have to start doing that uh, with, with the Indian Ocean uh, in case there is a conflict. We want to be prepared, and uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, we don't have that gap that I think that we do have right now. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Meredith, do you? Thanks. Um, on the risk side, I think we spent a fair amount of time uh, talking about that. So maybe I'll just say there's an opportunity as well. I think, you know, the United States... Um, is a very desired partner in Southeast Asia, both in terms of economic partnership, but also uh, even for countries in Southeast Asia that are very close to China, like uh, Cambodia and Laos, for example, they want to have a choice of partners. They want to preserve their strategic autonomy. Um, and we have uh, a lot of opportunities to strengthen our relationships going forward particularly if we meet um, countries where they are in terms of talking about our mutual interests um, in, in the region and at a global scale. Thank you. Anish? 
Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, we talked earlier about the erosion of democracy in South Asia, but I'll identify one more geopolitical risk uh, in the region, which is energy. Um, uh, India and Bangladesh in particular are two of the fastest growing um, developing countries in the world. Uh, and India may even be the fastest, and it's going to create skyrocketing demands for energy and power. Um, and this can undermine what the United States is trying to do, not only in the region, but also elsewhere. India was one of the only few countries that increased its imports of oil from Russia after the invasion of Ukraine. Not only did they not sanction Russia, but they sort of helped prop up its oil-based economy. Um, and, that's, and that's directly undermining what the United States is trying to accomplish. So this, this is definitely an area to watch for South Asia going forward. Well, thank you, Anish. Thank you, all of you. Uh, we need to wrap up. Um, this has been a, a terrific morning. Um, it's wonderful to be launching our new uh, program. Please stay tuned. A lot of activities are going to be forthcoming uh, over, the, uh, over the next year and beyond. So I'd like to thank not only our panelists up here, but our other panelists and speakers uh, today, as well as all of you tuning in here in person and online. I must also thank the, the Wilson Center's audiovisual and multimedia team, the external relations team, who've provided invaluable support that we very much appreciate. And of course, as well, my Indo-Pacific program colleagues, especially Shihoko, and your terrific leadership for this. Thank you. Um, why don't we have a round of applause for everyone who adjourned. Thank you all, and we're adjourned.